Where do we get our values from? I do not understand our values. By the way, speaking of American values, aren't we about due to start bombing some small country that only has a marginally effective air force? Seems to me like we're weeks overdue to drop high explosives on helpless civilians. People who have no argument with us whatsoever. I think we ought to be out there doing what we do best, gang, making large holes in other people's countries. I hate to be repetitious, but we are a warlike lot. We can't stand it not to be fucking with somebody. We couldn't wait for that Cold War to be over, could we? Couldn't wait for the Cold War to be over so we can go and play with our toys in the sand. Go and play with our toys in the sand. And when we're not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our Nintendo pilots, then... <laughs> Then we're usually declaring war on something here at home. Did you ever notice that about us? We love to declare war on things here in America. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war on it. It's the only metaphor, the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems, declaring war. We have to declare a war on everything. We have a war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on litter, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. But you ever notice, we got no war on homelessness, huh? No war on homelessness. You know why? There's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you could find a solution, if you could find a solution to homelessness where the corporate swine and the politicians could steal a couple of million dollars each, you'd see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty goddamn quick. I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. I got an idea about homelessness. You know what they ought to do? Change the name of it. Change the name of it. It's not homelessness. It's houselessness. It's houses these people need. A home is an abstract idea. A home is a setting. It's a state of mind. These people need houses. Physical, tangible structures. They need low-cost housing. But where are you going to put it? Well, that's fine, but where are you going to put it? Where are you going to put it? Nobody wants you to build low-cost housing near their house. People don't want it near them. We got something in this country, you've heard of it, it's called NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y. Not in my backyard. <laughs> People don't want anything, any kind of social help located anywhere near them. You try to open up a halfway house, try to open up a drug rehab or an alcohol rehab center, try to do a homeless shelter somewhere, try to open up a little home for some retarded people who want to work their way into the community. People say, not in my backyard. People don't want anything near them, especially if it might help somebody else. Part of that great American spirit of generosity we hear about. Great, generous American spirit. You can ask an Indian about that. Ask an Indian about if you can find one. You've got to locate an Indian first. We've made them just a little difficult to find. Well, if you need current data, select a black family at random. Ask them how generous America has been to them. People don't want anything near them, even if it's something they believe in, something they think society needs, like prisons. Everybody wants more prisons, right? Everybody wants more prisons. People say, build more prisons! But not here. <laughs> but why not? What's wrong? What's the problem? What's wrong with having a prison in your neighborhood? It seemed to me like it would make it a pretty crime-free area, don't you think? You think a lot of crackheads and pimps and hookers and thieves are going to be hanging around in front of a fucking prison? <laughs> Bullshit, they ain't coming anywhere near it. What's wrong with these people? All the criminals are locked up behind the walls, and if a couple of them do break out, what do you think they're going to do? Hang around? <laughs> Check real estate trends? Bullshit. <laughs> they're fucking gone. That's the whole idea of breaking out of prison, is to get the fuck as far away as you possibly can. <laughs> Not in my backyard. People don't want anything near them, except military bases. They don't mind that, do they? They like that. Give them an army base, give them a navy base, makes them happy. Why? Jobs. Jobs. Self-interest. Even if the base is loaded with nuclear weapons, they don't give a fuck. They say, well, I'll take a little radiation if I can get a job. <laughs> Working people have been fucked over so long in this country, those are the kind of decisions they're left to make. I've got just the place for low-cost housing. I have solved this problem. I know where we can build housing for the homeless. Golf courses. Perfect. Golf courses. Just what we need. Just what we need. Plenty of good land in nice neighborhoods. Land that is currently being wasted on a meaningless, mindless activity engaged in engaged in primarily by white, well-to-do male businessmen who use the game to get together to make deals to carve this country up a little finer among themselves. I am getting tired, really, 
getting tired of these golfing cocksuckers in their green pants and their yellow pants and their orange pants and their precious little hats and their cute little golf carts. It is time to reclaim the golf courses from the wealthy and turn them over to the homeless. Golf is an arrogant, elitist game and it takes up entirely too much room in this country. Too much room in this country. It is an arrogant game on its very design alone. Just the design of the game speaks of arrogance. Think of how big a golf course is. The ball is that fucking big. What do these pinheaded pricks need with all that land? There are over 17,000 golf courses in America. They average from 150 to 200 acres apiece. That's 3 million plus acres. 4,820 square miles. You could build two Rhode Islands and a Delaware for the homeless on the land currently being wasted on this meaningless, mindless, arrogant, elitist, racist, there's another thing, the only blacks you'll find in country clubs are carrying trays, and a boring game, boring game for boring people. You ever watch golf on television? It's like watching flies fuck. <laughs> and a mindless game, mindless. Think of the intellect it must take to draw pleasure from this activity. Hitting a ball with a crooked stick and then, walking after it. And then, hitting it again. I say, pick it up, asshole. You're lucky you found the fucking thing. Put it in your pocket and go the fuck home. You're a winner. You're a winner. You found it. No. Never happened. No. No chance of that happening. Dorco in the plaid knickers is gonna hit it again and walk some more. Let these rich cocksuckers play miniature golf. Let them fuck with a windmill for an hour and a half or so. See if there's really any skill among these people. Now, I know there are some people who play golf who don't consider themselves rich. Fuck them! And shame on them for engaging in an arrogant, elitist pastime. Hey, here's another place we could put some low-cost housing. Cemeteries! There's another idea whose time has passed. Saving all the dead people and for one part of town? What the hell kind of a medieval superstitious religious bullshit idea is that? Plow these motherfuckers up, plow them into the streams and rivers of America. We need that phosphorus for farming. If we're going to recycle, let's get serious. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'd like to talk a little bit about the war in the Persian Gulf. Big doings in the Persian Gulf. You know my favorite part of that war? It's the first war we ever had that was on every channel plus cable. And the war got good ratings too, didn't it? Got good ratings. Well, we like war. We like war. We're a warlike people. We like war because we're good at it. And you know why we're good at it? Because we get a lot of practice. This country's only 200 years old and already we've had 10 major wars. We average a major war every 20 years in this country, so we're good at it. And it's a good thing we are. We're not very good at anything else anymore. Huh? Can't build a decent car, can't make a TV set or a VCR worth the fuck. Got no steel industry left, can't educate our young people, can't get health care to our old people, but we can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Huh? We can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Especially if your country is full of brown people. Oh, we like that, don't we? That's our hobby. That's our new job in the world, bombing brown people. Iraq, Panama, Grenada, Libya, you got some brown people in your country, tell them to watch the fuck out or we'll goddamn bomb them. Well, when's the last white people you can remember that we bombed? Can you remember the last white, can you remember any white people we've ever bombed? The Germans, those are the only ones and that's only because they were trying to cut in on our action. They wanted to dominate the world. Bullshit, that's our fucking job. That's our fucking job. Now we only bomb brown people. 
Not because they're trying to cut in on our action, just because they're brown. <laughs> now, you probably noticed I don't feel about that war the way we were told we were supposed to feel about that war, the way we were ordered and instructed by the United States government to feel about that war. You see, I tell you, my mind doesn't work that way. I got this real moron thing I do, it's called thinking. <laughs> And I'm not a very good American because I like to form my own opinions. I don't just roll over when I'm told to. Sad to say, most Americans just roll over on command, not me. I have certain rules I live by. My first rule, I don't believe anything the government tells me. Nothing. Zero. Nope. And I don't take very seriously the media or the press in this country, who in the case of the Persian Gulf War were nothing more than unpaid employees of the Department of Defense, and who most of the time, most of the time function as kind of an unofficial public relations agency for the United States government. So I don't listen to them, I don't really believe in my country, and I gotta tell you folks, I don't get all choked up about yellow ribbons and American flags. I consider them, I consider them to be symbols, and I leave symbols to the symbol-minded. <laughs> me, I look at war a little bit differently. To me, war is a lot of prick-waving, okay? Simple thing, that's all it is. War is a whole lot of men standing out in the field waving their pricks at one another. <laughs> men are insecure about the size of their dicks, and so they have to kill one another over the idea. That's what all that asshole jock bullshit is all about. That's what all that adolescent macho male posturing and strutting in bars and locker rooms is all about. It's called dick fear. <laughs> Men are terrified that their pricks are inadequate, and so they have to compete with one another to feel better about themselves. And since war is the ultimate competition, basically men are killing each other in order to improve their self-esteem. You don't have to be a historian or a political scientist to see the bigger dick foreign policy theory at work. It sounds like this. What? They have bigger dicks? Bomb them! And of course, the bombs and the rockets and the bullets are all shaped like dicks. It's a subconscious need to project the penis into other people's affairs. It's called fucking with people! So, as far as I'm concerned, that whole thing in the Persian Gulf was nothing more than a big prick-waving dick fight. In this particular case, Saddam Hussein had questioned the size of George Bush's dick. And George Bush had been called a wimp for so long, Wimp rhymes with limp. George has been called a wimp for so long that he has to act out his manhood fantasies by sending other people's children to die. Even the name Bush. Even the name Bush is related to the genitals without being the genitals. A Bush is a sort of passive secondary sex characteristic. Now, if this man's name had been George Boner, well, he might have felt a little bit better about himself and we wouldn't have had any trouble over there in the first place. This whole country has a manhood problem, big manhood problem in the USA. You can tell from the language we use. Language always gives you away. What did we do wrong in Vietnam? We pulled out. Huh? Not a very manly thing to do, is it? When you're fucking people, you gotta stay in there and fuck them good, fuck them all the way, fuck them till the end, fuck them to death, fuck them to death, fuck them to death. Stay in there and keep fucking them until they're all dead. We left a few women and children alive in Vietnam and we haven't felt good about ourselves since. That's why in the Persian Gulf, George Bush had to say, this will not be another Vietnam. He actually used these words. He said, this time we're going all the way. <laughs> Imagine an American president using the sexual slang of a 13-year-old to describe his foreign policy. 
If you want to know what happened in the Persian Gulf, just remember the names of the two men who were running that war. Dick Cheney and Colin Powell. <laughs> Somebody got fucked in the ass. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, something a little more positive for you. Don't want you to think the whole show is just negativity. This is about a festival. This is my idea for one of those big outdoor summer festivals. This is called Slugfest. And this is for men only. Here's what you do. You get about 100,000 of these fucking men. You know the ones I mean, these macho motherfuckers. Yeah, these strutting, preening, posturing, hairy, sweaty, alpha male jack-offs. The muscle assholes. You take about 100,000 of these disgusting pricks, and you throw them in a big dirt arena, big 25-acre dirt arena, and you just let them beat the shit out of each other for 24 hours nonstop. No food, no water, just whiskey and PCP. And you just let them punch and pound and kick the shit out of each other until only one guy is left standing. Then you take that guy and you put him on a pedestal and you shoot him in the fucking head. Yeah. Yeah. Then you put the whole thing on TV. Budweiser would jump at that shit in half a minute. And guys would volunteer. Guys would line up. All you got to do is promise them a small appliance of some kind. Men will do anything. Just give them something that plugs in the wall, makes a whirring noise. And now here's another male cliche. These guys who cut the sleeves off of their T-shirts so the rest of us can have an even more compelling experience of smelling their armpits. I say, hey, Bruno, shut it down, would you please? You smell like an anchovy's cunt, okay? Bad. Not good. Whoa. 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 Not good. Not good, Bruno. Not, and definitely not for sharing, okay? This is the same kind of guy that has that barbed wire tattoo that goes all the way around the bicep. You've seen that, haven't you? That's just what I need. Some guy who hasn't been laid since the bicentennial wants me to think he's a bad motherfucker because he's got a picture, a ha ha, a painting of some barbed wire on his eyes. Hey, Junior, come around when you have the real thing on there. I'll squeeze that shit on good and tight for you, okay? No kidding. No kidding. This is the same kind of guy, if you smash him in the face eight or nine times with a big chunk of concrete and then beat him over the head with a steel rod for an hour and a half, you know what? He dropped like a fucking rock. Like a rock. Here's another guy thing that sucks. These t-shirts that say, lead, follower, get out of the way. You ever see that? This is more of that stupid Marine Corps bullshit. Obsolete male impulses from 100,000 years ago. Lead, follower, get out of the way. You know what I do when I see that shirt? I obstruct. <laughs> I stand right in the guy's path, force him to walk around. He gets a little past me. I spin him around, kick him in the nuts, rip off the shirt, wipe it on my ass, and shove it down his fucking throat. That's what I do when I see that shirt. Yeah. Hey, listen. That's all these Marines are looking for, a good time. And speaking of tough guys, I'm getting a little tired of hearing that after six policemen get arrested for shoving a floor lamp up some black guy's ass and ripping his intestines out, the police department announces they're going to have sensitivity training. I say, hey, if you need special training to be told not to jam a large, cumbersome object up someone else's asshole, maybe you're too fucked up to be on the police force in the first place. Huh? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. Listen. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you know what they ought to do? They ought to have two new requirements for being on the police. Intelligence and decency. You never can tell. It might just work. It certainly hasn't been tried yet. No one should ever have any object placed inside their asshole that is larger than a fist and less loving than a dildo. Okay? Now. Now. This next thing is about our president. This is about our president. Bill Jeff. Bill Jeff. Bill Jeff. Clinton. I don't call him Clinton. I call him Clinton. C-L-I-T. T-I-N apostrophe. 
Hey, old Bill, he loved JFK, didn't he? That's his hero, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Always wanted to be like JFK. Well, JFK's administration was called Camelot. Although it really should have been called Camelot. Because that's what he did. He came a lot. So Clinton's looking for a legacy. That's what he should call it. Well, maybe come a little would be better for him. Because he came a little. You know, little on the dress, little on the desk. Not a whole lot, really. Hey, he was no match for Kennedy in the pussy department. Kennedy aimed high. Marilyn Monroe. Clinton showed his dick to a government clerk. There's a drop-off here. There's a drop-off. All right. Now listen, I got a few more items of things that are pissing me off. And this one comes in the form of a question. Haven't we had about enough of this cigar-smoking shit in this country? Huh? Huh? Jesus. God. When is this going to end? When is this shit going to go away? When are these fat, arrogant, overpaid, overfed, overprivileged, overindulged, white-collar, business criminal, asshole, cocksuckers? Gonna put out their cigars and move along to their next abomination. White pussy businessmen sucking on a big brown dick. That's all it is. That's all it is. That's all it ever was. Yeah. A big brown dick. Sigmund Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Oh yeah, well sometimes it's a big brown dick. With a fat, arrogant, white-collar business criminal asshole sucking on the wet end of it. But hey, the news is not all bad for me. Not all bad. You want to know the good part? Cancer of the mouth. Good. Fuck them. Makes me happy. It's an attractive disease. Goes nice with a cell phone. So light up, suspender man, and suck that smoke deep down into your empty suit and blow it out your ass, you fucking cocksucker! Now, thank you, thank you. Hey. Now, a lot of these company names and product names are influenced by marketing and advertising people. This next thing is about advertising. This is called advertising lullaby. Keeping in mind, of course, that the whole purpose of advertising is to lull you to sleep. Quality, value, style, service, selection, convenience, economy, savings, performance, experience, hospitality, low rates, friendly service, name brands, easy terms, affordable prices, money-back guarantee, free installation. Free admission, free appraisal, free alterations, free delivery, free estimates, free home trial, and free parking. No cash, no problem, no kidding. No fuss, no muss, no risk, no obligation, no red tape, no down payment, no entry fee, no hidden charges, no purchase necessary, no one will call on you, no payments or interest till September. But limited time only though so act now order today send no money offer good while supplies last two to a customer each item sold separately batteries not included mileage may vary all sales are final allow six weeks for delivery some items not available some assembly required some restrictions may apply so come on in come on in thank you. come on in thank you so come on in. Come on in for a free demonstration and a free consultation with our friendly professional staff. Our experienced and knowledgeable sales representatives will help you make a selection that's just right for you and just right for your budget. And say, don't forget to pick up your free gift. A classic, deluxe, custom, designer, luxury, prestige, high-quality, premium, select, gourmet, pocket pencil sharpener. <laughs> Yours for the asking, no purchase necessary. It's our way of saying thank you. And if you act now, we'll include an extra added free complimentary bonus gift, a classic deluxe custom designer luxury prestige, high quality premium select gourmet combination key ring, magnifying glass and garden hose in a genuine imitation leather style carrying case with authentic vinyl trim. Yours for the asking, no purchase necessary. It's our way of saying thank you. Actually, it's our way of saying bend over just a little bit farther so we can stick this big advertising dick up your ass a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. You miserable, no good fucking consumer asshole. 
It's just like the business world, same as business. Everybody knows by now, all businessmen, completely full of shit. Just the worst kind of low-life criminal cocksuckers you could ever want to run into. A fucking piece of shit businessman. And the proof of it is, the proof of it is, they don't even trust each other. They don't trust one another. When a businessman sits down to negotiate a deal, the first thing he does is to automatically assume that the other guy is a complete lying prick who's trying to fuck him out of his money. So he's got to do everything he can to fuck the other guy a little bit faster and a little bit harder. And he's got to do it with a big smile on his face. You know that big bullshit businessman smile? And if you're a customer, whoa, that's when you get the really big smile. Customer always gets that really big smile as the businessman carefully positions himself directly behind the customer and unzips his pants and proceeds to service the account. I'm servicing this account. This customer needs service. Now you know what they mean. Now you know what they mean when they say, we specialize in customer service. <laughs> Whoever coined the phrase, let the buyer beware, was probably bleeding from the asshole. <laughs> but that's business. That's business. Why is it that most of the people who are against abortion are people you wouldn't want to fuck in the first place? <laughs> huh? Boy, these conservatives are really something, aren't they? They're all in favor of the unborn. They will do anything for the unborn. But once you're born, you're on your own. <laughs> Pro-life conservatives are obsessed with the fetus from conception to nine months. After that, they don't want to know about you. They don't want to hear from you. No nothing. No neonatal care, no daycare, no Head Start, no school lunch, no food stamps, no welfare, no nothing. If you're pre-born, you're fine. If you're preschool, you're fucked. <laughs> you're fucked. <laughs> Conservatives don't give a shit about you until you reach military age. <laughs> then they think you are just fine, just what they've been looking for. Conservatives want live babies so they can raise them to be dead soldiers. <laughs> Pro-life. Pro-life. These people aren't pro-life, they're killing doctors. What kind of pro-life is that? What, they'll do anything they can to save a fetus, but if it grows up to be a doctor, they just might have to kill it? <laughs> they're not pro-life. You know what they are? They're anti-woman. Simple as it gets, anti-woman. They don't like them. They don't like women. They believe a woman's primary role is to function as a broodmare for the state. Pro-life. You don't see many of these white anti-abortion women volunteering to have any black fetuses transplanted into their uteruses, do you? No, you don't see them adopting a whole lot of crack babies, do you? No, that might be something Christ would do. And you won't see, you won't see a lot of these pro-life people dousing themselves in kerosene and lighting themselves on fire. You know, morally committed religious people in South Vietnam knew how to stage a goddamn demonstration, didn't they? Huh? Hey. They knew how to put on a fucking protest. Light yourself on fire! Come on, you moral crusaders, let's see a little smoke to match that fire in your belly. Here's another question I have. How come when it's us, it's an abortion, and when it's a chicken, it's an omelet? <laughs> wait. 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 What? Are, are we so much better than chickens all of a sudden? When did this happen, that we passed chickens in goodness? Name six ways we're better than chickens. See, nobody can do it. You know why? Because chickens are decent people. You don't see chickens hanging around in drug gangs, do you? Uh, you don't see a chicken strapping some guy to a chair and hooking up his nuts to a car battery, do you? When's the last chicken you heard about came home from work and beat the shit out of his hand, huh? Doesn't happen. 
because chickens are decent people. But let's get back to this abortion shit. Now, is a fetus a human being? This seems to be the central question. Well, if a fetus is a human being, how come the census doesn't count them? If a fetus is a human being, how come when there's a miscarriage, they don't have a funeral? If a fetus is a human being, how come people say we have two children and one on the way, instead of saying we have three children? People say life begins at conception. I say life began about a billion years ago, and it's a continuous process. <laughs> continuous, just keeps rolling along. Rolling, rolling, rolling along. I said, you know something? Listen, you can go back further than that. What about the carbon atoms? Huh? <laughs> Human life could not exist without carbon. So is it just possible that maybe we shouldn't be burning all this coal? <laughs> just looking for a little consistency here in these anti-abortion arguments. See, the really hardcore people will tell you life begins at fertilization. Fertilization when the sperm fertilizes the egg, which is usually a few moments after the man says, gee, honey, I was going to pull out, but the phone rang and it startled me. <laughs> But even after the egg is fertilized, it's still six or seven days before it reaches the uterus and pregnancy begins. And not every egg makes it that far. 80% of a woman's fertilized eggs are rinsed and flushed out of her body once a month during those delightful few days she has. <laughs> they wind up on sanitary napkins, and yet they are fertilized eggs. So basically what these anti-abortion people are telling us is that any woman who's had more than one period is a serial killer. <laughs> Consistency. Consistency. Hey, hey, if they really want to get serious, what about all the sperm that are wasted when the state executes a condemned man and one of these pro-life guys who's watching comes in his pants, huh? <laughs> Here's a guy standing over there with his jockey shorts full of little Vinnies and Debbies, and nobody's saying a word to that guy. Not every ejaculation deserves a name. Now... Speaking of consistency, Catholics, which I was until I reached the age of reason, <laughs> Catholics, <laughs> Catholics and other Christians are against abortions and they're against homosexuals. Well, who has less abortions than homosexuals? <laughs> Leave these fucking people alone, for Christ's sakes. There is an entire class of people guaranteed never to have an abortion. <laughs> and the Catholics and Christians are just tossing them aside. You'd think they'd make natural allies. <laughs> Go look for consistency in religion. And speaking to my friends the Catholics, when John Cardinal O'Connor of New York and some of these other cardinals and bishops have experienced their first pregnancies and their first labor pains and they've raised a couple of children on a minimum wage, then I'll be glad to hear what they have to say about abortion. I'm sure it'll be interesting. Enlightening, too. But, but, in the meantime, what they ought to be doing is telling these priests who took a vow of chastity to keep their hands off the altar boys. <laughs> When Jesus said, suffer the little children, come unto me, that's not what he was talking about. <laughs> so you know what I tell these anti-abortion people? I say, hey, hey, if you think a fetus is more important than a woman, try getting a fetus to wash the shit stains out of your underwear. <laughs> For no pay and no pension. I tell them, think of an abortion as term limits. That's all it is, biological term limits. But you know, the longer you listen to this abortion debate, the more you hear this phrase, sanctity of life. You've heard that, sanctity of life. You believe in it? Personally, I think it's a bunch of shit. <laughs> well, I mean, life is sacred? Who said so? God? Hey, if you read history, you realize that God is one of the leading causes of death. <laughs> Has been for thousands of years. Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Christians, all taking turns killing each other because God told them it was a good idea. <laughs> the sword of God, the blood of the lamb, vengeance is mine. Millions of dead motherfuckers. 
millions of dead motherfuckers, all because they gave the wrong answer to the God question. <laughs> you believe in God? No. <laughs> dead. <laughs> you believe in God? Yes. You believe in my God? No. <laughs> dead. <laughs> my God has a bigger dick than your God. of years thousands of years and all the best wars too the bloodiest most brutal wars fought all based on religious hatred which is fine with me hey anytime a bunch of holy people want to kill each other i'm a happy guy <laughs> but don't be giving me all this shit about the sanctity of life i mean even if there were such a thing i don't think it's something you can blame on god now you know where the sanctity of life came from we made it up you know why because we're alive Self-interest. Living people have a strong interest in promoting the idea that somehow life is sacred. You don't see Abbott and Costello running around talking about this shit, do you? We're not hearing a whole lot from Mussolini on the subject. What's the latest from JFK? Not a goddamn thing. Because JFK, Mussolini, and Abbott and Costello are fucking dead. They're fucking dead. And dead people give less than a shit about the sanctity of life. Only living people care about it, so the whole thing grows out of a completely biased point of view. It's a self-serving, man-made bullshit story. It's one of these things we tell ourselves so we'll feel noble. Life is sacred. Makes you feel noble. Well, let me ask you this. If everything that ever lived is dead, and everything alive is gonna die, where does the sacred part come in? I'm having trouble with that. Because, I mean, even with the stuff we preach about the sanctity of life, we don't practice it. We don't practice it. Look at what we kill. Mosquitoes and flies, because they're pests. <laughs> Lions and tigers, because it's fun. <laughs> Chickens and pigs, because we're hungry. <laughs> Pheasants and quails, because it's fun. And we're hungry. <laughs> and people, we kill people, because they're pests. <laughs> And it's fun! <laughs> and you might have noticed something else. The sanctity of life doesn't seem to apply to cancer cells, does it? You rarely see a bumper sticker that says, Save the tumors. <laughs> or I break for advanced melanoma. <laughs> ah, viruses, mold, mildew, maggots, fungus, weeds, E. coli bacteria, the crabs. <laughs> Nothing sacred about those things. So at best, the sanctity of life is kind of a selective thing. We get to choose which forms of life we feel are sacred, and we get to kill the rest. Pretty neat deal, huh? You know how we got it? We made the whole fucking thing up! <laughs> made it up! The same way... Thank you. The same way we made up the death penalty. We made them both up, sanctity of life and the death penalty. Aren't we versatile? <laughs> and you know, in this country now, there are a lot of people who want to expand the death penalty to include drug dealers. This is really stupid. Drug dealers aren't afraid to die. They're already killing each other every day on the streets by the hundreds. Drive-bys, gang shootings, they're not afraid to die. Death penalty doesn't mean anything unless you use it on people who are afraid to die. Like the bankers who launder the drug money. <laughs> the bankers who launder the drug money. Forget the dealers. You want to slow down that drug traffic, you got to start executing a few of these fucking bankers. White, middle-class, Republican bankers. And I'm not talking about soft American executions like lethal injection. I'm talking about fucking crucifixion, folks. <laughs> Let's bring back crucifixions, a form of capital punishment that Christians and Jews of America can really appreciate. Here's one more item for you, the last in our civics book. Rights. Boy, everyone in this country is always running around yammering about their fucking rights. I have a right. You have no right. We have a right. They don't have a right. Folks, I hate to spoil your fun, but there's no such thing as rights, okay? They're imaginary. We made them up, like the boogeyman. <laughs> the three little pigs, Pinocchio, Mother Goose, shit like that. Rights are an idea. They're just imaginary. They're a cute idea, cute, but that's all cute and fictional. But if you think you do have rights, let me ask you this. Where do they come from? People say, well, they come from God. They're God-given rights. Oh, fuck, here we go again. 
There we go again. The God excuse. The last refuge of a man with no answers and no argument. It came from God. Anything we can't describe must have come from God. Personally, folks, I believe that if your rights came from God, he would have given you the right to some food every day, and he would have given you the right to a roof over your head. God would have been looking out for you. God would have been looking out for you. You know that? He wouldn't have been worried about making sure you have a gun so you could get drunk on Sunday night and kill your girlfriend's parents. But let's say it's true. Let's say God gave us these rights. Why would he give us a certain number of rights? The Bill of Rights in this country has 10 stipulations, okay? 10 rights. And apparently God was doing sloppy work that week because we've had to amend the Bill of Rights an additional 17 times. So God forgot a couple of things like slavery. Just fucking slipped his mind. But let's say... Let's say God gave us the original 10. He gave the British 13. The British Bill of Rights has 13 stipulations. The Germans have 29. The Belgians have 25. The Swedish have only six. And some people in the world have no rights at all. What kind of a fucking goddamn God-given deal is that? No rights at all? Why would God give different people in different countries different numbers of different rights? Boredom? Amusement? Bad arithmetic? Do we find out at long last, after all this time, that God is weak in math skills? Doesn't sound like divine planning to me. Sounds more like human planning. Sounds more like one group trying to control another group. In other words, business as usual in America. Now, if you think you do have rights, one last assignment for you. Next time you're at the computer, get on the internet, go to Wikipedia. When you get to Wikipedia, in the search field for Wikipedia, I want you to type in Japanese Americans 1942, and you'll find out all about your precious fucking rights, okay? All right. You know about it. You know about it. Yeah. In 1942, there were 110,000 Japanese American citizens and good standing law abiding people who were thrown into internment camps simply because their parents were born in the wrong country. That's all they did wrong. They had no right to a lawyer, no right to a fair trial, no right to a jury of their peers, no right to due process of any kind. The only right they had, right this way. <laughs> into the internment camps. Just when these American citizens needed their rights the most, their government took them away. And rights aren't rights if someone can take them away. They're privileges. That's all we've ever had in this country is a bill of temporary privileges. And if you read the news even badly, you know that every year the list gets shorter and shorter and shorter. You see how soon Yeah. Sooner or later, the people in this country are going to realize the government does not give a fuck about them. Government doesn't care about you or your children or your rights or your welfare or your safety. It simply doesn't give a fuck about you. It's interested in its own power. That's the only thing, keeping it and expanding it wherever possible. Personally, when it comes to rights, I think one of two things is true. I think either we have unlimited rights or we have no rights at all. Personally, I lean toward unlimited rights. I feel, for instance, I have the right to do anything I please. But if I do something you don't like, I think you have the right to kill me. So where are you going to find a fairer fucking deal than that? So the next time some asshole says to you, I have a right to my opinion, you say, oh yeah, well I have a right to my opinion, and my opinion is you have no right to your opinion. Then shoot the fuck and walk away. Thank you. I think about stuff like that. It's interesting to me, like I said. Suicide's interesting. Life is filled with interesting things. That's why I could never commit suicide. I'm having too much fun keeping an eye on you folks, watching what you do, human behavior. That's what I like. Humans do some really interesting things. Like besides killing ourselves, we also kill each other. Murder. And we're the only ones who do that, by the way. We're the only species on earth that deliberately kills members of our own species for personal gain or pleasure, sometimes it's just fun. <laughs> We're also the only species that deliberately kills members of another species for personal gain. 
or pleasure. That's what hunters do. They kill for pleasure. That's us, human beings, interesting folks, murderers. Here's an interesting form of murder we come up with, assassination. You know what's interesting about assassination? Well, not only does it change those popularity polls in a big fucking hurry, <laughs> but it's also interesting to notice who it is we assassinate. Do you ever notice who it is? Stop to think of who it is we kill. It's always people who've told us to live together in harmony and try to love one another. Jesus, Gandhi, Lincoln, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John Lennon. They all said, try to live together peacefully. Bam! <laughs> right in the fucking head. Apparently, we're not ready for that. <laughs> yeah, that's difficult behavior for us. We're too busy sitting around trying to think up ways to kill each other. Here's one we came up with. It's efficient, too. Genocide, you know? Killing large numbers of people simply because they don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they don't have the same kind of hats you do. <laughs> you ever notice that anytime you see two groups of people who really hate each other, chances are good they're wearing different kind of hats. Keep an eye on that, it might be important. <laughs> but anytime there's genocide, there are always mass graves, right? Every time we kill some dictator and go march into his country, we always find mass graves. Thousands and thousands of dead bodies of people the dictator killed. And everybody over here gets horrified. Whoa, mass graves, mass graves, whoa. Well, shit, what's a guy supposed to do with a couple thousand people he just killed? <laughs> Dig separate holes? Fuck that shit. <laughs> it's labor intensive, get real. The whole idea of killing a large number of people at one time in one place is convenience. Efficiency. <laughs> Throw them in the fucking hole. <laughs> Look at it this way. At least the dictator had the decency to throw a little dirt on them. Give the guy some credit. Dictator's a busy man. Got a lot on his mind. Like trying to figure out who's planning to kill him. So he can pick him up, put him in prison, and torture them. Torture. That's another one of our heartwarming human activities we picked up along the way torturing each other. You want to hear a really cool torture that the Romans invented? They also used it as a form of capital punishment. It's really creative. They would take the guy in question, stuff him in a burlap sack, seal a sack up real tight and throw it in the river. But, and here's the creative part, inside the sack with the guy, they would put a dog, a monkey, and a snake. Okay? A dog, a monkey, and a snake. That's fucking creative. Imagine being inside a burlap sack, underwater, in the dark, sitting next to a drowning monkey. <laughs> Think he'd be moving around a little bit? The dog would be going ape shit, we know that. And the snake, well, he'd probably be getting curious about what all the activity was inside the sack. He might do anything. But whatever he did, it would probably involve venom and his teeth. You know what you'd be doing? You'd be praying to God that the snake bit the monkey and the dog ate the snake. <laughs> praying. Yeah, then... Then it would be just you and the dog, man and his best friend, drowning together. Maybe before you died, you could teach him a few tricks. Roll over and play dead wouldn't be too difficult, would it? Just a thought, just a playful thought. By the way, I assume you're noticing that all these activities I'm mentioning, murder, torture, genocide, these are all things human beings do, not animals, those creatures we feel superior to. This is us. Here's another one of our spiritually uplifting activities. We don't do this one much anymore, but it used to be really big. Human sacrifice. I miss that. The Aztecs loved human sacrifice, and they were good at it. Well, they got a lot of practice. For instance, right around the year 1500, the Aztecs sacrificed 80,000 people in one ceremony. Okay? 80,000 people, one ceremony. You know what the occasion was? They were opening a new temple. <laughs> Nothing like religion for a little entertainment, huh? Especially that old time religion. Know how the Aztecs went about their sacrificing? Here's how they did it. They would do it right out in public, right in front of everybody, big town, beautiful city square, 20, 30,000 people looking on. They would take the guy, lay him on an altar, cut his chest open, pull his heart out, and hold it up in the air while it was still beating. Got that? <laughs> cut his chest open, pull his heart out, and hold it up in the air while it was still beating. You know what you call that? Theater. That is fucking theater. And although the procedure may have been a little too crude to be considered the first bypass surgery, 
It could easily be seen as an early form of organ donor program. <laughs> the Aztecs, human beings, just like us. Not too long ago, 500 years, Columbus had already landed. This is just south of here, Mexico. And by the way, those hearts didn't go to waste, did not go to waste, because right after the ceremonies, the royal family, naturally, would enjoy another one of our amusing activities, cannibalism. Imagine that, chowing down on another human being. You gotta be all out of beef jerky, man. You gotta be really fucking hungry. But it happens, doesn't it? It still happens to this day. Bunch of people stranded in the wilderness, run out of Pop-Tarts, gotta eat something. Might as well be Steve. And how do you decide who to eat first? How do you decide who's first on the barbecue rack? Do you pick on the little guy because he's skinny and he can't fight back? Or do you all gang up on the bodybuilder because he got a lot of steaks and chops on him? These are things human beings have to consider. One more of these charming diversions of ours. Necrophilia. Huh? Now there's a hobby for you. Fucking a corpse. Takes a special kind of guy, don't you think? But it happens, it happens, more than you might think. It happens among humans. Animals don't do that. Animals don't fuck their dead. A rat will do a lot of gross things, but he will not fuck a dead rat. It wouldn't even occur to him. <laughs> Only a human being would think to fuck someone who just died. We gotta be the most interesting critters on the planet. And then we wonder why a UFO doesn't just land and say hello. You know the best thing about necrophilia? You don't have to bring flowers. Yeah, usually they're already there. Isn't that nice? It's nice. It's convenient. Human beings will do anything, anything, I am convinced. That's why when all those beheadings started in Iraq, didn't bother me, I took it right in stride. A lot of people here were horrified. Ah, oh, beheadings, beheadings. What are you, fucking surprised? Just one more form of extreme human behavior. Besides, who cares about some mercenary civilian contractor from Oklahoma who gets his head cut off? Fuck him. Fuck him. Hey, Jack, you don't want to get your head cut off? Stay the fuck in Oklahoma. <laughs> Stay the fuck in Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They ain't cutting off heads in Oklahoma, <laughs> as far as I know. But I do know this. You strap on a gun and go strutting around some other man's country, you better be ready for some action, Jack. You better be ready for some action. People are touchy about that sort of thing. And let me ask you this while I have you good, clean Americans here. This is a, a moral question, not rhetorical. I'm looking for the answer. What is the moral difference between cutting off one guy's head or two or three or five or 10 and dropping a big bomb on the hospital and killing a whole bunch of sick kids? Has anyone in authority explained this to you? I have not heard a word. Didn't get an email, didn't get a postcard, didn't get an instant message, not a fucking thing. Now, in case you're wondering why I have a certain interest and fascination, let's call it, with torture and genocide and human sacrifice, necrophilia, it's because all of these things go to show me once again, but over and over and over, what beasts we human beings really are. You know, when you get right down to it, when you get right down to it, Human beings are nothing more than ordinary jungle beasts, savages. No different from the Cro-Magnon people who lived 25,000 years ago in the Pleistocene forest eating grubs off of rotten logs. No different. Our DNA hasn't changed substantially in 100,000 years. We're still operating out of the lower brain, the reptilian brain, fight or flight, kill or be killed. Now. We like to think we've evolved and advanced because we can build a computer, fly an airplane, travel underwater. We can write a sonnet, paint a painting, compose an opera. But you know something? We're barely out of the jungle on this planet. Barely out of the fucking jungle. What we are is semi-civilized beasts with baseball caps and automatic weapons. <laughs> and this civilization of ours that we're so proud of, this civilization with its so-called civilized behavior, you ever stop and realize how fragile all this is? How easily it could all just break right down? Just break right down. Wouldn't take much. 
probably happened in less than two years. Wouldn't take much or to throw us right back into barbaric times. All you'd have to do would be eliminate electricity. That's all. But completely eliminate electricity. So, no electricity, no lights. You're back to candles and lanterns, campfires and bonfires. Batteries couldn't be recharged. Generators couldn't be refueled because fuel is pumped electrically. So is water, by the way. So no lights, no fuel, no water, no computers. And computers run everything. And among the many things computers run that operate on electricity are security systems. It's in all of our jails and prisons and nut houses. So suddenly, without electricity, all across America, the gates and cell doors of penitentiaries and mental institutions would fly open. And out would come all of our old friends. The ones who've been away at camp. Serial killers, mass murderers, felony rapists, armed robbers, carjackers, home invaders, thieves, burglars, kidnappers, sadists, pedophiles, sexual predators, pimps, pushers, pornographers, speed freaks, crackheads, sick, junkies, all the ethnic street gangs, black, Spanish, and Asian gangs, Japanese Yakuza, Russian mafia, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, Sicilian hitmen, Italian mobsters, Jamaican and Colombian drug gangs. And those are just the ones we caught. Let's not forget their counterparts, still on the outside right now, waiting to hook up with their prison buddies so they can start a new organization, the American Federation of Sociopaths. Just what the country needs, another special interest group. Eight to 10 million of them there'd be, counting all the parolees and all the probationers and the ones who've never been caught. Eight to 10 million bitter, angry, violent, sexually hyperactive alpha males with nothing to do no hobbies, no medications, no scruples. Just a bunch of bad guys looking for a good time. Maybe dropping by your house. Hi, hope we're not intruding. Got any beer? Oh, good. Well, I got about 1,400 really thirsty guys here. How about women? Got any women? Oh, just your wife, huh? Well, I think we can make that work. <laughs> now, boys, there's a lady here, so I want you to mind your manners and wait your turn. <laughs> Police wouldn't help you. They'd be gone at the first sign of trouble. They'd be home protecting their own families. So would the Army and the National Guard. You'd be alone. You'd be on your own. You'd be SOL and JWF. Shit out of luck and jolly well fucked. <laughs> Shit out of luck and jolly well fucked. After a couple of years of living like that, beheadings would be the least of your problems. People would be lining up to be beheaded. So let's get back to suicide, which now seems like a reasonable alternative. <laughs> the system is beginning to collapse, and everything is slowly breaking down. I enjoy chaos and disorder, not just because they help me professionally, they're also my hobby. You see, I'm an Entropy fan. I'm an Entropy fan. When I first heard of Entropy in high school science, I was attracted to it immediately. When they told me that in nature, all systems are breaking down, I thought, what a good thing. What a good thing. Perhaps I can make some small contribution in this area myself. And of course, it's not just in nature. In this country, the whole social structure just beginning to collapse. You watch just beginning now to come apart at the edges and the seams. Well, I think it is certainly apparent by now that one of the things I enjoy in life is excess. I like things that are excessive. I like excessive behavior, excessive language, excessive violence. It's fun, it's interesting, it's exciting. I like it when nature is excessive. That's why I like natural disasters. All these natural disasters have been going on, I fucking love them. I can't get enough of them. Oh, when nature's going crazy, throwing things around, scaring people and destroying property, I'm a happy fucking guy. I'm a happy fucking guy. I look at it this way. For centuries now, man has done everything he can to destroy, defile, and interfere with nature. Clear-cutting forests, strip-mining mountains, poisoning the atmosphere, 
overfishing the oceans, polluting rivers and lakes, destroying wetlands and aquifers. So when nature strikes back and smacks man in the head and kicks him in the nuts, I enjoy that. I have absolutely no sympathy for human beings whatsoever. None. And no matter what kind of problem humans are facing, whether it's natural or man-made, I always hope it gets worse. <laughs> don't you, don't you, don't you have a part of you, a part of you that secretly hopes everything gets worse? When you see a big fire on TV, don't you hope it spreads? <laughs> don't you hope it gets completely out of control and burns down six counties? You don't root for the firemen, do you? I mean, I don't want them to get hurt or nothing, but I don't want them putting out my fire. That's my fire. That's nature showing off and having fun. I like fires. You know something else I like? Those spring floods in the Midwest. Aren't they great? Like clockwork, spring floods in the Midwest. But I'm starting to notice, I'm starting to catch on that every year it's the same story. Another flood in the same place with the same people on the same river. Same fucking people! <laughs> and these people do not move. They will not fucking move. They, 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 they repaint, put down new carpeting and wallpaper, and they move right back into the same fucking house on the floodplain next to the river, and then they wonder why grandma's floating downstream with the parakeet on her head. <laughs> fourth time. Again. Fourth fucking time. There's no learning curve with these people. It's very hard to feel sorry for them. Every year, same people, same rowboats, out there paddling around, rescuing a chicken. What the fuck kind of a life is that? Well, our kids love it here. Oh, really? What do they got, gills? And while they're showing all that shit on the screen, the announcer is saying to me, it's been raining steadily for three months now. The ground can't hold any more water. The river is cresting higher than it has in two centuries. The levees have washed away. And I just hope it keeps raining and 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 it rains steadily for five years. And then after that, for 10 years, it's cloudy with occasional showers and the river never returns to its natural banks it becomes a completely new river and the borders of three states have to be changed and all the maps and atlases have to be redrawn and reprinted and no one's couch ever completely dries out for years and years every time they sit down there's always a little squish Dan, Linda, come on in you guys, have a seat squish, squish I like that. People just refuse to be realistic. They don't like to be realistic. People would rather stroke themselves. You know, oh, they like to stroke themselves. Don't they stroke themselves? They stroke each other, they get stroked. They stroke the boss, the boss strokes them. Everybody strokes everybody. It's nothing but a big stroke job in this country. The government strokes you every day of your life. Religion never stops stroking you. Big business gives you a good stroke and it's one big transcontinental cross country red, white and blue stroke job. Do you know? Yeah. You know what the national emblem of this country ought to be? Forget that bald eagle. The national emblem of this country ought to be Uncle Sam standing naked at attention saluting and seated on a chair next to him, the Statue of Liberty, jerking him off. <laughs> That would be a perfect symbol for the United Strokes of America. <laughs> it's all bullshit, folks. That's what you have to remember as you go through life in this country. It's all bullshit, and it's bad for you. Because <laughs> you do know, folks, you do know, living in this country, you know that every time you're exposed to advertising, you realize once again that America's leading industry, America's most profitable business is still the manufacture, packaging, distribution, and marketing of bullshit. 
High quality, grade A, prime cut, pure American bullshit. And the sad part is, most people seem indoctrinated to believe that bullshit only comes from certain places, certain sources, advertising, politics, salesmen, not true, bullshit is everywhere, bullshit is rampant, parents are full of shit, teachers are full of shit, clergymen are full of shit, and law enforcement people are full of shit. This entire country, this entire country is completely full of shit and always has been from the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution to the Star Spangled Banner. It's really nothing more than one big steaming pile of red, white and blue all-American bullshit. Because think of how we started. Think of that. This country was founded by a group of slave owners who told us all men are created equal. Oh yeah, all men, except for Indians and niggers and women, right? Always like to use that authentic American language. This was a small group of unelected white male landholding slave owners who also suggested their class be the only one allowed to vote. Now that is what's known as being stunningly and embarrassingly full of shit. And I think, I think Americans really show their ignorance when they say they want their politicians to be honest. What are these fucking cretins talking about? If honesty were suddenly introduced into American life, the whole system would collapse. No one would know what to do. Honesty would fuck this country up. And I think deep down Americans know that. That's why they elected and re-elected Bill Clinton. You betcha. You betcha. Yeah. Because the American people like their bullshit right out front where they can get a good strong whiff of it. Clinton might be full of shit, but at least he lets you know it. Doesn't he? Dole tried to hide it, didn't he? Dole kept saying, I'm a plain and honest man. Bullshit. People don't believe that. What did Clinton say? He said, hi folks, I'm completely full of shit and how do you like that? And the people said, you know something? At least he's honest. At least he's honest about being completely full of shit. Tell the truth, don't be bullshitting people. Like I say, there's enough bullshit as it is. In fact, there's just enough. Did you know that? There's just enough bullshit in this country to hold things together. Bullshit is the glue that binds us as a nation. Where would we be without our safe, familiar American bullshit? Land of the free, home of the brave, the American dream. All men are equal, justice is blind, the press is free, business is honest, the good guys win, your vote counts, the police are on your side, God is watching you. Your standard of living will always improve. <laughs> and everything is gonna be just fine. The official national bullshit story. I call it the American okie doke. Everyone. Every one of those items is provably untrue at one level or another, but we believe them because they're pounded into our heads from the time we're children. That's what they do with that kind of thing. Pounded into the heads of kids because they know that children are much too young to be able to muster an intellectual defense against a sophisticated idea like that. And they know that up to a certain age, children believe everything their parents tell them. And as a result, they never learn to question things. Nobody questions things in this country anymore. Nobody questions anything. Everybody's too fat and happy. Everybody's got a cell phone that'll make pancakes and rub their balls now, you know? <laughs> Way too fucking prosperous for our own good. Way too fucking prosperous. Americans have been bought off and silenced by toys and gizmos, and no one learns to question things. You remember? You remember? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I say, no one questions things. You remember Barbara Bush? I call her the silver douchebag. You remember her? <laughs> Barbara Bush. She is the mother of Governor George Bush. I call him Governor Bush because that's the only elected office he ever held legally in our country, okay? George Bush, Governor Bush. Yeah. I don't care where they hang his portrait. I don't care how big his library is. He'll always be Governor Bush. I don't even capitalize his name when I type it anymore. So she's the mother of Governor George Bush. She's also the wife of his father, George H.W. Bush, who did become president in the normal, legal, traditional manner. And when he did, she came along for the ride, 
as first lady. And that's been the tradition up till now. A man has been elected and the woman has come along for the ride as the first lady. And usually, as in American life in general, the woman is condescended to, patronized, given something to do to keep her busy. A lot of times they give her a charity or a cause, something she can champion. Betty Ford was told to drink, remember that? <laughs> yeah, remember that? That's right. Betty Ford was told, you drink, Betty, Betty, you drink and get really fucked up, okay? <laughs> Just get totally fallen down, fucked up, drunk, shit-faced, and blow your liver out. Blow your fucking liver out, honey. <laughs> then we'll hose you down and we'll put you in a place and get you well there and put your name on the place and Liza Minnelli can get well and everything's going to be okay. You know what I mean? So, that was her assignment. That was her assignment. Barbara Bush's assignment was getting children to read. Remember that? Getting children to read. They figured she had had so much success with George. <laughs> you know? you know? That she would be a natural to get children to read, which misses the point completely. Not important to get children to read. Children who want to read are going to read. Kids who want to learn to read are going to learn to read. Much more important to teach children to question what they read. Children should be taught to question everything, to question everything they read, everything they hear. Children should be taught to question authority. Parents never teach their children to question authority because Parents are authority figures themselves and they don't want to undermine their own bullshit inside the household. So they stroke the kid and the kid strokes them and they all stroke each other and they all grow up all fucked up and they come to shows like this. <laughs> Children have to be told there's bullshit coming down the road. They have to be warned that life is about detecting the bullshit and fending it off as best you can. No one told me a thing like that. I was never warned about any of this. I had to find all of it out for myself. And there are still, as with you probably, a lot of things that you're expected to believe and accept in America that uh, I personally have a problem with and I question a lot of these things. Give you an example. I saw a slogan on a guy's car that said, proud to be an American. And I thought, well, what the fuck does that mean? proud to be an American. You see, I've never understood national pride. I've never understood ethnic pride because uh, I'm Irish and I'm all four of my grandparents were born in Ireland, so I'm fully Irish. And when I was a kid, I would go to the St. Patrick's Day Parade and I noticed that they sold a button that said proud to be Irish. And I could never understand that because I knew that on Columbus Day, they sold a different button that said proud to be Italian. Then came black pride and Puerto Rican pride. And I could never understand ethnic or national pride because to me, Pride should be reserved for something you achieve or attain on your own, not something that happens by accident of birth. Being Irish... <laughs> Being Irish isn't a skill. It's a fucking genetic accident. You wouldn't say I'm proud to be 5'11". I'm proud to have a predisposition for colon cancer. So why the fuck would you be proud to be Irish or proud to be Italian or American or anything? If, hey, if you're happy with it, that's fine. Do that. Put that on your car. Happy to be an American. Be happy. Don't be proud. Too much pride as it is. Pride goeth before a fall. Never forget Proverbs, okay? Now, but say what you want about America. Land of the free, home of the brave. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. Dumbass motherfuckers, you know? Yeah. Now, obviously, that doesn't include this audience. I understand that. You seem intelligent and perceptive, but the rest of them, holy jumping fucking shitballs. Dumber than a second coat of paint. And this ain't just ranting and raving. This ain't just blowing off steam. I got a little evidence to support my claim. It just seems to me, seems to me, that only a really low IQ population could have taken this beautiful continent this magnificent American landscape that we inherited. Well, actually, we stole it from the Mexicans and the Indians, but <laughs> hey, it was nice when we stole it. It looked pretty good. It was pristine. Paradise. Have you seen it lately? Have you taken a good look at it lately? It's fucking embarrassing. Only a nation of unenlightened half-wits could have taken this beautiful place and turned it into what it is today, a shopping mall. A big fucking shopping mall. 
You know that? That's all you got. That's all you've got here, folks. Mile after mile of mall after mall. Many, many malls. Major malls and mini malls. They put the mini malls in between the major malls. And in between the mini malls, they put the mini marts. And in between the mini marts, you got the car lots, gas stations, muffler shops, laundromats, cheap hotels, fast food joints, strip clubs, and dirty bookstores. America the beautiful. One big transcontinental commercial cesspool. And how do the people feel about all this? How do the people feel about living in a coast-to-coast -coast shopping mall? Well, they think it's just fucking dandy <laughs> they think it is cool as can be because Americans love the mall they love the mall that's where they get to satisfy their two most prominent addictions at the same time shopping and eating Millions of semi-conscious Americans, day after day, shuffling through the malls, shopping and eating, especially eating. Americans love to eat. They are fatally attracted to the slow death of fast food. Hot dogs, corn dogs, triple bacon, cheeseburgers, deep fried butter, dipped in pork fat and cheese whiz, mayonnaise soaked, barbecued mozzarella, patty melts. Americans will eat anything, anything, if you were selling sautéed raccoons assholes on a stick. <laughs> Americans would buy them and eat them. Especially if you dip them in butter and put a little salsa on them. And don't forget the mayonnaise and peanut butter. This country is big time, pig time. Forget the bald eagle. You know what the national emblem of this country ought to be? A big bowl of macaroni and cheese. A big bowl, because everything in this country is king size. King size, extra large, and super jumbo. Especially the fucking people. Have you seen some of the people in this country? Have you taken a good look at some of these big fat motherfuckers walking around? Big fat motherfuckers. Oh my God, huge piles of redundant protoplasm lumbering through the malls like a fleet of interstate buses. The people in this country are immense, massive bellies, monstrous thighs and big fat fucking asses. And if you stand there for a minute and you look at one of them, you look at one of them, you, you, you begin to wonder, how does this woman take a shit? How does she shit? And even more frightening, how does she wipe her ass? Can she even locate her asshole? She must require assistance. Are paramedics trained in this field? And standing right next to her, of course, with a plate full of nachos and a mouthful of pie as her clueless fucking husband, Joe Sixpack. With his monstrous swollen beer belly hanging dangerously out over his belt buckle like a 90 pound tumor. This guy hasn't seen his dick since the Nixon administration. And if you stand there and you look at the two of them, you begin to wonder to yourself, do these people fuck? Is this man actually capable of fucking this woman? It doesn't seem structurally possible that these two people could achieve penetration. Maybe they're in that Cirque du Soleil or something. I'm telling you, every other person in this country is 50 pounds overweight. They are gargantuan. And in the summertime, God help us. In the summertime, they all wanna wear short pants. Jesus, Lord, protector of all that is good and holy, deliver me from fat people in short pants. They all got short pants, big bellies, fat thighs, and dumb kids. Short pants, big bellies, fat thighs, and dumb kids. Every one of them's got two dumb ass kids with them. And the whole family is wearing t-shirts, and every one of them's got the same t-shirt. I'm with stupid. <laughs> Apparently in this country, the stupids are an extended family. And besides wearing them t-shirts, everyone in the family's got on a backpack. They got a backpack strapped to their back so they can carry around lots of stupid shit. And the reason they gotta carry their stupid shit strapped to their backs is because their hands must remain free at all times to hold food. And to get that food up to the mouth where it gets shoveled in with all the rest of the disgusting shit they ate that day. And another reason for the backpacks is these people are gonna buy even more stupid shit. They ain't got enough stupid shit at home. They just had a stupid shit sale. They ain't gonna buy more. They're gonna go out in the parking lot and stuff this stuff into the big, fat, ugly, oversized SUV that's got plenty of room in it. Plenty of room in it for stupid shit and lots of room left over for these big, fat, ugly motherfuckers to get them home. Stopping, of course, for jelly roll and fried dough. These people, 
These people are efficient, professional, compulsive consumers. That's their civic duty, consumption. It's the new national pastime, fuck baseball, it's consumption. The only true, lasting American value that's left, buying things, buying things. People spending money they don't have on things they don't need. Money they don't have on things they don't need so they can max out their credit cards and spend the rest of their lives paying 18% interest on something that costs 1250. And they didn't like it when they got it home anyway. Not too bright, folks. Not too fucking bright. But if you talk to one of them about this, if you isolate one of them, you sit them down rationally, and you talk to them about the low IQs and the dumb behavior and the bad decisions, right away they start talking about education. That's the big answer to everything. Education. They say, we need more money for education. We need more, more, more books, more teachers, more classrooms, more schools. Uh, we need more testing for the kids. And you say to them, well, you know, we've tried all of that, and the kids still can't pass the test. He says, oh, don't you worry about that. We're going to lower the passing grades. And that's what they do in a lot of these schools now. They lower the passing grades so more kids can pass. More kids pass, the school looks good, everybody's happy, the IQ of the country slips another two or three points, and pretty soon all you'll need to get into college is a fucking pencil. <laughs> Got a pencil? Get the fuck in there, it's physics. <laughs> then everyone wonders why 17 other countries graduate more scientists than we do. Education! Politicians know that word, they use it on you. Politicians have traditionally hidden behind three things. The flag, the Bible, and children. No child left behind. No child left behind. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't long ago you were talking about giving kids a head start. Head start, left behind. Someone's losing fucking ground here. <laughs> but there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks. And it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got. Because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The big, wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. Politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. That's right. You know something? They don't want people who are smart enough to sit around the kitchen table to figure out how badly they're getting fucked by a system that threw them overboard 30 fucking years ago. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept all these increasingly shittier jobs with the lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime, and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. And now they're coming for your social security money. They want your fucking retirement money. They want it back so they can give it to their criminal friends on Wall Street. And you know something? They'll get it. They'll get it all from you sooner or later because they own this fucking place. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. <laughs> you and I are not in the big club. And by the way, it's the same big club they use to beat you over the head with all day long when they tell you what to believe. All day long, beating you over the head in their media, telling you what to believe, what to think, and what to buy. The table is tilted, folks. The game is rigged. And nobody seems to notice. Nobody seems to care. Good, honest, hard-working people, white collar, blue collar, doesn't matter what color shirt you have on. Good, honest, hard-working people continue. These are people of modest means. Continue to elect these rich cocksuckers who don't give a fuck about them. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't care about you at all, at all, at all. Yeah, you know? And nobody seems to notice, nobody seems to care. That's what the owners count on, the fact that Americans will probably remain willfully ignorant of the big red, white, and blue dick that's being jammed up their assholes every day. <laughs> because the owners of this country know the truth. It's called the American dream, because you have to be asleep to believe it. Here's another slogan. Here's another slogan you run into all the time. God bless America. 
Once again, respectfully, I say to myself, what the fuck does that mean? God bless America? Is that a request? Is that a demand? Is that a suggestion? Politicians say it at the end of every speech, as if it were some sort of verbal tick that they can't get rid of. God bless you and God bless America. God bless you and God bless America. I guess they figure if they leave it out, someone's gonna think they're bad Americans. Let me tell you a little secret about God, folks. God does not give a flying fuck about America, okay? He doesn't care. He never cared about this country. He, he never has, he never will. He doesn't care about this country any more than he cares about Mongolia, Transylvania, Pittsburgh, the Suez Canal, or the North Pole. He simply doesn't care, okay? He doesn't care. Listen, hey, there are 200 countries in the world now. Do these people honestly think that God is sitting around picking out his favorites? Why would he do that? Why would God have a favorite country? And why would it be America out of all the countries? Because we have the most money? Because he likes our national anthem? Maybe it's because he heard we have 18 delicious flavors of classic rice a it's delusional thinking, it's delusional thinking, and Americans are not alone with these sort of delusions. Military cemeteries around the world are packed with brainwashed, dead soldiers who are convinced God was on their side. America prays for God to destroy our enemies. Our enemies pray for God to destroy us. Somebody's gonna be disappointed. <laughs> Somebody's wasting their fucking time. Could it be everyone? <laughs> now, now. If people want to say God bless America, that's their business, I don't care, but here's what I don't understand. If they say God bless America, presumably they believe in God. And if they do, they must have heard God loved everyone. That's what he said. He loved everyone and he loved them equally. So why would these people ask God to do something that went against his own teachings? You know what these God bless America people ought to do? They ought to check with that Jesus fellow they're so crazy about. <laughs> They're always talking about what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? They don't want to know so they can do it. They just want to know so they can tell other people to do it. Well, I'll tell you what Jesus would have done. I'll tell you what Jesus would have done. He would have got up on the top of the Empire State Building and said, God bless everyone around the world forever and ever till the end of time. That's what Jesus would have done. And that's what these people should do. Or else they should admit that God bless America is really just some sort of an empty slogan with no real meaning except for something vague like, good luck. <laughs> good luck, America. You're on your own. Which is a little bit closer to the truth. Here's one more item for you, the last in our civics book. Rights. Boy, everyone in this country is always running around yammering about their fucking rights. I have a right. You have no right. We have a right. They don't have a right. Folks, I hate to spoil your fun, but there's no such thing as rights, okay? They're imaginary. We made them up. Like the boogeyman. <laughs> the three little pigs, Pinocchio, Mother Goose, shit like that. Rights are an idea. They're just imaginary. They're a cute idea. Cute. But that's all cute and fictional. But if you think you do have rights, let me ask you this. Where do they come from? People say, well, they come from God. They're God-given rights. Oh, fuck, here we go again. Here we go again. The God excuse. The last refuge of a man with no answers and no argument, it came from God. Anything we can't describe must have come from God. Personally, folks, I believe that if your rights came from God, he would have given you the right to some food every day, and he would have given you the right to a roof over your head. God would have been looking out for you. God would have been looking out for you. You know that? He wouldn't have been worried about making sure you have a gun so you get drunk on Sunday night and kill your girlfriend's parents. <laughs> but let's say it's true. Let's say God gave us these rights. Why would he give us a certain number of rights? The Bill of Rights in this country has 10 stipulations, okay? 10 rights. And apparently God was doing sloppy work that week because we've had to amend the Bill of Rights an additional 17 times. So God forgot a couple of things like slavery just fucking slipped his mind. <laughs> but let's say, let's say God gave us the original 10. He gave the British 13. The British Bill of Rights has 13 stipulations. The Germans have 29. The Belgians have 25. The Swedish have only six. And some people in the world have no rights at all. What kind of a fucking goddamn God-given deal is that? <laughs> No rights at all? Why would God give different people in different countries different numbers of different rights? 
Boredom? Amusement? Bad arithmetic? Do we find out at long last, after all this time, that God is weak in math skills? Doesn't sound like divine planning to me. Sounds more like human planning. Sounds more like one group trying to control another group. In other words, business as usual in America. Now, if you think you do have rights, one last assignment for you. Next time you're at the computer, get on the internet, go to Wikipedia. When you get to Wikipedia, in the search field for Wikipedia, I want you to type in Japanese Americans 1942, and you'll find out all about your precious fucking rights, okay? All right. You know about it. You know about it. Yeah. In 1942, there were 110,000 Japanese American citizens and good standing, law abiding people who were thrown into internment camps simply because their parents were born in the wrong country. That's all they did wrong. They had no right to a lawyer, no right to a fair trial, no right to a jury of their peers, no right to due process of any kind. The only right they had, right this way. <laughs> into the internment camps. Just when these American citizens needed their rights the most, their government took them away. And rights aren't rights if someone can take them away. They're privileges. That's all we've ever had in this country is a bill of temporary privileges. And if you read the news even badly, you know that every year the list gets shorter and shorter and shorter. You see how soon Yeah. Sooner or later, the people in this country are going to realize the government does not give a fuck about them. Government doesn't care about you or your children or your rights or your welfare or your safety. It simply doesn't give a fuck about you. It's interested in its own power. That's the only thing. Keeping it and expanding it wherever possible. Personally, when it comes to rights, I think one of two things is true. I think either we have unlimited rights or we have no rights at all. Personally, I lean toward unlimited rights. I feel, for instance, I have the right to do anything I please. But if I do something you don't like, I think you have the right to kill me. So where are you going to find a fairer fucking deal than that? So the next time some asshole says to you, I have a right to my opinion, you say, oh yeah, well I have a right to my opinion, and my opinion is you have no right to your opinion. Then shoot the fuck and walk away. Thank you. You know, I've been out here all this time and I haven't been complaining about anything yet. I think it's time we moved right into the complaint department. You know, because, listen, this is just a series of things that are pissing me off, all right? Because I don't have pet peeves, I have major psychotic fucking hatreds, all right? And I'll tell you this, it makes the world a lot easier to sort out. First thing on my list tonight, airport security. Tired of this shit, there's too much of it. There's too much security at the airports. I'm tired of some guy with a double digit IQ and a triple digit income rooting around inside of my bag for no reason and never finding anything. <laughs> Haven't found anything yet in anybody's bag. Haven't found one bomb in one bag. And don't tell me, well, the terrorists know their bags are gonna be searched, so now they're leaving their bombs at home. There are no bombs. The whole thing is fucking pointless. And it's completely without logic. There's no logic at all. They'll take away a gun, but let you keep a knife. Well, what the fuck is that? In fact, there's a whole list of lethal objects they will allow you to take on board. Theoretically, you could take a knife, a nice pick, a hatchet, a straight razor, a pair of scissors, a chainsaw, six knitting needles, and a broken whiskey bottle. And the only thing they're going to say to you is that bag has to fit all the way under the seat in front of you. And, and if you didn't bring a weapon on board, relax. After you've been flying for about an hour, they're going to bring you a knife and fork. They actually give you a fucking knife. It's only a table knife, but you could kill a pilot with a table knife. Might take you a couple of minutes, you know. 
Yeah, especially if he's hefty, huh? Yeah. But you can get the job done if you really want to kill the prick. Shit, there's a lot of things you could use to kill a guy with. You could probably beat a guy to death with the Sunday New York Times, couldn't you? Or suppose you just had really big hands. Couldn't you strangle a flight attendant? Shit, you could probably strangle two of them, one with each hand. You know, if you were lucky enough to catch them in that little kitchen area before they break out the fucking peanuts, you know? But you could get the job done if you really cared enough. So why is it they allow a guy with big, powerful hands to get on board an airplane? I'll tell you why. They know he's not a security risk because he's already answered the three big questions. Question number one, did you pack your bags yourself? No, Carrot Top packed my bags. He, he and Martha Stewart and Florence Henderson came over to the house last night, fixed me a lovely lobster Newburgh, gave me a full body massage with sacred oils from India, performed a four-way around the world, and then they packed my bags. Next question. Have your bags been in your possession the whole time? No. Usually the night before I travel, just as the moon is rising, I place my suitcases out on the street corner and leave them there unattended for several hours. Just for good luck. Next question. Has any unknown person asked you to take anything on board? Hmm. Well, what exactly is an unknown person? Surely everyone is known to someone. In fact, just this morning, Kareem and Youssef Ali Ben Gaba seemed to know each other quite well. They kept joking about which one of my suitcases was the heaviest. And that's another thing they don't like at the airport, jokes. You know? Yeah, you can't joke about a bomb. Well, why is it just jokes? What about a riddle? How about a limerick? How about a bomb anecdote? You know, no punchline, just a really cute story. Or suppose you intended the remark, not as a joke, but as an ironic musing. Are they prepared to make that distinction? Why, I think not. And besides, who's to say what's funny? Airport security is a stupid idea, it's a waste of money, and it's only there for one reason, to make white people feel safe. That's all, the illusion, the feeling and illusion of safety to placate the middle class, because the authorities know they can't make an airplane completely safe. Too many people have access. You'll notice the drug smugglers don't seem to have a lot of trouble getting their little packages on board, do they? No, and God bless them too. <laughs> yes. Oh. And by the way, an airplane flight shouldn't be completely safe. You need a little danger in your life. Take a fucking chance once in a while, will you? What are you gonna do, play with your prick for another 30 years? What are you gonna read People Magazine and eat at Wendy's till the end of time? Take a fucking chance. Besides, even if they made all of the airplanes completely safe, the terrorists would simply start bombing other places that are crowded. Porn shops, crack houses, titty bars, and gangbangs. You know, entertainment venues. The odds of you being killed by a terrorist are practically zero. So I say relax and enjoy the show. You have to be a realist. You have to be realistic about terrorism. Certain groups of people, certain groups, Muslim fundamentalist, Christian fundamentalist, Jewish fundamentalist, and just plain guys from Montana <laughs> are gonna continue to make life in this country very interesting for a long, long time. That's the reality. Angry men in combat fatigues talking to God on a two-way radio and muttering incoherent slogans about freedom are eventually going to provide us with a great deal of entertainment. 
especially after your stupid fucking economy collapses all around you and the terrorists come out of the woodwork. You'll have anthrax in the water supply and sarin gas in your air conditioners. There'll be chemical and biological suitcase bombs in every city. And I say, enjoy it. Relax. Enjoy the show. Take a fucking chance. Put a little fun in your life. To me, terrorism is exciting. It's exciting. I think the very idea that you can set off a bomb in a marketplace and kill several hundred people is exciting and stimulating, and I see it as a form of entertainment. <laughs> entertainment, that's all it is. Yeah. But, but I also know that most Americans are soft and frightened and unimaginative and they don't realize there's such a thing as dangerous fun. And they certainly don't recognize a good show when they see one. I have always been willing to put myself at great personal risk for the sake of entertainment. And I've always been willing to put you at great personal risk for the same reason. As far as I'm concerned, all of this airport security, all the searches, the screenings, the cameras, the questions, it's just one more way of reducing your liberty and reminding you that they can fuck with you anytime they want. As long as you put up with it. As long as you put up with it. Which means, of course, anytime they want. Because that's what Americans do now. They're always willing to trade away a little of their freedom in exchange for the feeling, the illusion of security. What we have now is a completely neurotic population obsessed with security and safety and crime and drugs and cleanliness and hygiene and germs. There's another thing, germs. Where did this sudden fear of germs come from in this country? Have you noticed this? The media constantly running stories about all the latest infections, salmonella, E. coli, hantavirus, bird flu, and Americans panic easily. So now everybody's running around scrubbing this and spraying that and overcooking their food and repeatedly washing their hands, trying to avoid all contact with germs. It's ridiculous and it goes to ridiculous lengths. In prisons, before they give you a lethal injection, they swab your arm with alcohol. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Well, well, they don't want you to get an infection. And you can see their point. Wouldn't want some guy to go to hell and be sick. It would take a lot of the sportsmanship out of the whole execution. Fear of germs, why these fucking pussies? You can't even get a decent hamburger anymore. They cook the shit out of everything now because everybody's afraid of food poisoning. Hey, where's your sense of adventure? Take a fucking chance, will you? You know how many people die from food poisoning every year in this country? 9,000, that's all. It's a minor risk. Huh? Shit. Take a fucking chance, bunch of goddamn pussies. Besides, what do you think you have an immune system for? It's for killing germs, but it needs practice. It needs germs to practice on. So, so listen, so listen. If you kill all the germs around you and live a completely sterile life, then when germs do come along, you're not going to be prepared. And never mind ordinary germs, what are you going to do when some super virus comes along that turns your vital organs into liquid shit? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to get sick, you're going to die, and you're going to deserve it because you're fucking weak and you got a fucking weak immune system. Now, all right, God damn it. Hey. All right. I want to tell you a true story about immunization. When I was a little boy in New York City in the 1940s, we swam in the Hudson River, and it was filled with raw sewage, okay? We swam in raw sewage. You know, to cool off. <laughs> and at that time, the big fear was polio. Thousands of kids died from polio every year. But you know something? In my neighborhood, no one ever got polio. No one, ever. You know why? Because we swam in raw sewage. <laughs> it strengthened our immune systems. The polio never had a prayer. We were tempered in raw shit. So personally, I never take any special precautions against germs. I don't shy away from people who sneeze and cough. I don't wipe off the telephone. I don't cover the toilet seat. And if I drop food on the floor, I pick it up and eat it. I eat it. Yes, I do. Even if I'm at a sidewalk cafe in Calcutta, the poor section, on New Year's morning during a soccer riot, 
And you know something? In spite of all that so-called risky behavior, I never get infections. I don't get them. I don't get colds. I don't get flu. I don't get food poisoning. And I don't get headaches or upset stomachs. And you know why? Because I got a good, strong immune system, and it gets a lot of practice. My immune system is equipped with the biological equivalent of fully automatic military assault rifles with night vision and laser scopes. And we have recently acquired phosphorus grenades, cluster bombs, and anti-personnel fragmentation mines. So, when my white blood cells are on patrol, reconnoitering my bloodstream, seeking out strangers and other undesirables, if they see any, any suspicious-looking germs of any kind, they don't fuck around. They whip out the weapons, they wax the motherfucker, and deposit the unlucky fellow directly into my colon. There's no nonsense. There's no Miranda warning. There's none of that three strikes and you're out shit. First defense, bam, into the colon you go. Ah, yeah, sure. Yeah, hey. All right. Oh. And speaking of my colon, I want you to know I don't automatically wash my hands every time I go to the bathroom, okay? Can you deal with that? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You know when I wash my hands? When I shit on them. That's the only time. That's the o- And you know how often that happens? Tops, tops, two, three times a week. Tops, tops. Maybe a little more frequently over the holidays, you know what I mean? And I'll tell you something else, my well-scrubbed friends. You don't always need a shower every day. Did you know that? It's overkill. Unless you work out or work outdoors or for some reason come in intimate contact with huge amounts of filth and garbage every day, you don't always need a shower. All you really need to do is to wash the four key areas. Armpits, asshole, crotch, and teeth. Got that? Armpits, asshole, crotch, and teeth. In fact, you can save yourself a whole lot of time if you simply use the same brush on all four areas. Thank you. I think we're part of a greater wisdom than we will ever understand. A higher order. Call it what you want. You know what I call it? The big electron. The big electron. Whoa. 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 It doesn't punish, it doesn't reward, it doesn't judge at all. It just is. And so are we, for a little while. Thanks for being here with me for a little while tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. And take care of somebody else. Thank you, good night. I'm a modern man, a man for the millennium, digital and smoke-free. A diversified, multicultural, postmodern deconstruction is politically, anatomically, and ecologically incorrect. I've been uplinked and downloaded, I've been inputted and outsourced, I know the upside of downsizing, I know the downside of upgrading. I'm a high-tech lowlife, a cutting-edge, state-of-the-art, bi-coastal multitasker, and I can give you a gigabyte in a nanosecond. I'm new wave, but I'm old school, and my inner child is outward bound. I'm a hot-wired, heat-seeking, warm-hearted, cool customer, voice-activated and biodegradable. I interface with my database, my database is in cyberspace, so I'm interactive, I'm hyperactive, and from time to time, I'm radioactive. <laughs> Behind the eight ball, ahead of the curve, riding the wave, dodging the bullet, pushing the envelope. I'm on point, on task, on message, and off drugs. I got no need for coke and speed. I got no urge to binge and purge. I'm in the moment, on the edge, over the top, but under the radar. A high concept, low profile, medium range ballistic missionary. A streetwise smart bomb. A top gun bottom feeder. I wear power ties, I tell power lies, I take power naps, I run victory laps. I'm a totally ongoing, bigfoot slam dunk rainmaker with a proactive outreach. A raging workaholic. A working rageaholic. Out of rehab and in denial. <laughs> Thank you.
I got a personal trainer, a personal shopper, a personal assistant, and a personal agenda. You can't shut me up. You can't dumb me down, because I'm tireless and I'm wireless. I'm an alpha male on beta blockers. I'm a non-believer and an overachiever, laid back but fashion forward, up front, down home, low rent, high maintenance, supersized, long-lasting, high definition, fast acting, oven ready and built to last. I'm a hands-on, footloose, knee-jerk head case, prematurely post-traumatic, and I have a love child who sends me hate mail. But I'm feeling, I'm caring, I'm healing, I'm sharing. A supportive, bonding, nurturing primary caregiver. My output is down, but my income is up. I take a short position on the long bond, and my revenue stream has its own cash flow. I read junk mail, I eat junk food, I buy junk bonds, I watch trash sports. I'm gender-specific, capital-intensive, user-friendly, and lactose intolerant. I like rough sex. I like tough love. I use the F word in my email, and the software on my hard drive is hardcore, no soft porn. I bought a microwave at a mini mall. I bought a minivan at a mega store. I eat fast food in the slow lane. I'm toll free, bite sized, ready to wear, and I come in all sizes. A fully equipped, factory authorized, hospital tested, clinically proven, scientifically formulated medical miracle. I've been pre washed, pre cooked, pre heated, pre screened, pre approved, pre packaged, post dated, freeze dried, double wrapped, vacuum packed, and I have an unlimited broadband capacity. I'm a rude dude, but I'm the real deal. Lean and mean, cocked, locked, and ready to rock. Rough, tough, and hard to bluff. I take it slow, I go with the flow, I ride with the tide, I got glide in my stride. Driving and moving, sailing and spinning, jiving and grooving, wailing and winning. I don't snooze, so I don't lose. I keep the pedal to the metal and the rubber on the road. I party hardy, and lunchtime is crunch time. I'm hanging in, there ain't no doubt, and I'm hanging tough over and out. Here's a, here's a civic custom that I don't understand. Maybe you can help me. Taking off your hat when a flag passes by, or when some jack off at the ballpark starts singing the national anthem, they tell you to take off your hat. What the fuck does a hat have to do with being patriotic? What possible relationship exists between the uncovered head and a feeling that ought to live in your heart? Suppose you have a red, white, and blue hat. Suppose you have a hat made out of a flag. Why would you take it off to honor the flag? Wouldn't you leave it on? And point it toward the flag. And, and what's so bad about hats that you have to take them off? Why not take off your pants? Or your shoes. They tell you that at the airport, they say, take off your shoes. They tell you it's a national security, so taking off your shoes could be patriotic too. I started to question all this stupid hat shit when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I was a Catholic, uh, at least until I reached the age of reason, okay? So I was a Catholic, I was a Catholic for about two, two and a half years, something like that. And during that time, one of the things they told us was that if a boy or a man went into a church, he had to remove his hat in order to honor the presence of God. But they had already told me that God was everywhere. So I used to wonder, well, if God is everywhere, why would you even own a hat? Why not show your respect? Don't even buy a fucking hat. And just to confuse things further, they told the women exactly the opposite. Catholic women and girls had to cover their heads when they went into church. Uh, same as in certain temples, Jewish men have to cover their, their heads in those temples. In those same temples, Jewish women not allowed to cover their heads. So try to figure this shit out. Catholic men and Jewish women, no hats. Catholic women and Jewish men, hats. Somebody's got the whole thing totally fucking backwards, don't you think? And, uh, you know, and what is this religious fascination with headgear? Every religion's got a different fucking hat. Did you ever notice that? The Hindus have a turban, the Sikhs have a tall white turban, Jews have a yarmulke, the Muslims have the keffiyeh, the bishop has a pointy hat on one day and a round hat on another day, cardinal has a red hat, pope has a... Everybody's got a fucking hat. One group takes them off, the other group puts them on. Personally, I would never want to be a member of any group where you either have to wear a hat or you can't wear a hat. I think... Uh,
I think all religions should have one rule and one rule only, hats optional. <laughs> That's all you need to run a really good religion. Here's another one of these civic customs. Swearing on the Bible. You understand that shit? They tell you to raise your right hand, place your left hand on the Bible. Does this stuff really matter? Which hand? Does God really give a fuck about details like this? Suppose you put your right hand in the Bible, you raise your left hand. Would that count? Or would God say, sorry, wrong hand, try again. And why does one hand have to be raised? What is the magic in this gesture? This seems like some sort of a primitive voodoo mojo shtick. Why not put your left hand on the Bible, let your right hand hang down by your side? It's more natural. Or put it in your pocket. Remember what your mother used to say? Don't put your hands in your pockets. Does she know something we don't know? Is this hand shit really important? But let's get back to the Bible, America's favorite national theatrical prop. Suppose the Bible they hand you to swear on is upside down, or backward, or both, and you swear to tell the truth on an upside down backward Bible. Would that count? Suppose the Bible they hand you is an old Bible and half the pages are missing. Suppose all they have is a Chinese Bible in an American court or a Braille Bible and you're not blind. Suppose they hand you an upside down backward Chinese Braille Bible with half the pages missing. At what point does all of this stuff just break down and become just a lot of stupid shit that somebody made up? They fucking made it up, folks. It's make-believe. It's make-believe. Now, all right. Okay. Let's leave the Bible aside. We'll get back to the science fiction reading later. The more important question is, what is the big deal about swearing to God in the first place? Why does swearing to God mean you're going to tell the truth? Wouldn't affect me. If they said to me, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God, I'd say, yeah. I'll tell you about as much truth as the people who wrote that fucking Bible. How do you like that? Huh? Huh? Swearing on the Bible doesn't mean anything. It's, it's kid, swearing to God is kid stuff. Did you, you ever, remember when you were a kid, if you, if you told another kid something he didn't quite believe, he'd say, you swear to God? I would always say, yeah, I swear to God. Even if I was lying. Why not? What's gonna happen if I lie? Nothing. Nothing happens if you lie. Unless you get caught and that's a whole different story. Sometimes a kid would think he was being slick with me and he'd say, you swear on your mother's grave? I'd say, yeah, why not? First of all, my mother was alive. She didn't even have a grave. <laughs> Second of all, even if she was dead, what's she gonna do, rise from the grave and come and haunt me? Come and haunt me? All because I told a lie to an eight-year-old? Get fucking real, will ya? Sometimes I would say, I swear on my mother's tits. <laughs> Kids are impressed with things like that. I mean, I don't care about my mother's tits either. I don't care if they fell off. Fuck her. <laughs> Not my problem. They're your tits, Ma. You keep an eye on them. <laughs> Swearing to God doesn't mean anything. Swearing on the Bible doesn't mean anything. You know why? Because Bible or no Bible, God or no God, if it suits their purposes, people are going to lie in court. The police do it all the time. All the time. Yes, they do. It's part of their job to protect, to serve, and to commit perjury whenever it supports the state's case. <laughs> Swearing on the Bible is just one more way of controlling people and keeping them in line. And it's one of these superstitious things that holds us back as a species. Something else I'm getting tired of is all this stupid bullshit we have to listen to all the time about children. It's all you hear in this country. Children. Help the children. What about the children? Save the children. You know what I say? Fuck the children. <laughs> Fuck them. They're getting entirely too much attention. And I know what you're thinking. You say, Jesus, he's not going to attack children, is he? Yes, he is. 
He's going to attack children. And remember, this is Mr. Conductor talking. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. And I also know all you single dads and soccer moms who think you're such fucking heroes aren't going to like this, but somebody's got to tell you for your own good, your children are overrated and overvalued. You've turned them into little cult objects. You have a child fetish, and it's not healthy. And don't give me that weak shit. Well, I love my children. Fuck you. Everybody loves their children. Doesn't make you special. John Wayne Gacy loved his children. Kept them all right out in the yard near the garage. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this constant, mindless yammering in the media, this neurotic fixation that says somehow everything, everything has to revolve around children. It's completely out of balance. Listen, there are a couple of things about kids you have to remember. First of all, they're not all cute, okay? Yeah, in fact, if you look at them closely, some of them are rather unpleasant looking. And a lot of them don't smell very good either, all right? Some of the really little ones seem to have kind of a sour milk and urine combination going on. So they stay with me on this. The sooner you face it, the better off you're going to be. Second premise. Not all children are smart and clever. Got that? Kids are like any other group of people. A few winners are a whole lot of losers. There are a lot of loser kids out there who simply aren't going anywhere and you can't save them all you can't save them all you got to let them go you got to cut them loose you got to stop over protecting them because you're making them too soft today's kids are way too soft for one thing there's too much emphasis on safety childproof medicine bottles fireproof pajamas child restraints car seats and helmets baseball bicycles skateboard helmets kids have to wear helmets now for everything but jerking off Grown-ups have taken all the fun out of being a kid just to save a few thousand lives. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. What's happening is... All right, what's happening... You know what it is? These baby boomers, these soft, fruity baby boomers, are raising an entire generation of soft, fruity kids who aren't even allowed to have hazardous toys, for Christ's sakes hazardous toy shit. Whatever happened to natural selection? Survival of the fittest. The kid who swallows too many marbles doesn't grow up to have kids of his own. Simple as that. Simple. Nature. Nature. Nature knows best. We're saving entirely too many lives in this country of all ages. Nature should be allowed to do its job of killing off the weak and sickly and ignorant people without interference from airbags and batting helmets. Just think of it as passive eugenics. Now, here's another example of overprotection. Did you ever notice on the TV news, every time some guy with an AK-47 strolls onto a schoolyard and kills three or four kids and a couple of teachers, the next day, the next day, the school is overrun with counselors and psychiatrists and grief counselors and trauma therapists trying to help the children cope. Shit. When I was in school, someone came to our school and killed three or four of us. We went right on with our arithmetic. 35 classmates minus four <laughs> equals 31. We were tough. We were tough. I say if kids can handle the violence at home, they ought to be able to handle the violence in school. I'm not worried about guns in school. You know what I'm waiting for? Guns in church. That's gonna be a lot of fun. And it'll happen, you watch. Some nut will go fucking ape shit in the church and they'll refer to him as a disgruntled worshiper. <laughs> Here. Here's another bunch of ignorant shit. School uniforms. Bad theory. The idea that if kids wear uniforms to school, it helps keep order. Don't these schools do enough damage making all these kids think alike? Now they're gonna get them to look alike too? And it's not a new idea. I first saw it in old newsreels from the 1930s, but it was hard to understand because the narration was in German. <laughs> All right. One more. Thank you. Thank you. One more item about children, and that is this superstitious nonsense that blames tobacco companies for kids who smoke. Listen, kids don't smoke because a camel in sunglasses tells them to. 
They smoke for the same reasons adults do, because it relieves anxiety and depression. And you'd be anxious and depressed too if you had to put up with these pathetic, insecure, striving, anal, yuppie parents who enroll you in college before you're old enough to know which side of the playpen smells the worst. And then they fill you full of Ritalin and drag you all over town in search of meaningless structure. Little League, Cub Scouts, swimming, soccer, karate, piano, bagpipes, watercolors, witchcraft, glass blowing, and dildo practice. They even, they even have play dates, for Christ's sakes. Playing is now done by appointment. Whatever happened to you show me your wee-wee and I'll show you mine. Hey. No wonder kids smoke, it helps. Not as much as weed, but hey, you can't have everything. You know it's true, parents are burning these kids out on structure. I think every day, all children should have three hours of daydreaming, just daydreaming. That, you could use a little of it yourself, by the way. Just sit at the window, stare at the clouds, it's good for you. If you wanna know how you can help your children, leave them the fuck alone. It's all bullshit, folks. It's all bullshit and it's bad for you. Now, speaking of parents and speaking of bullshit, uh, two ideas which aren't always mutually exclusive, by the way, I'd like to mention a special kind of bullshit that has taken hold in this country in the last 30 to 40 years. It's a form of bullshit that really only can be called child worship. It's child worship. It's this excessive devotion to children. I'm talking about today's professional parents, these obsessive diaper sniffers, <laughs> who are overscheduling and overmanaging their children and robbing them of their childhoods. Even the simple act of playing. Even the simple act of playing has been taken away from children and put on mommy's schedule in the form of play dates. Something that should be spontaneous and free is now being rigidly planned. When does a kid ever get to sit in the yard with a stick anymore? You know, just sit there with a fucking stick. Do today's kids even know what a stick is? You know, you sit in the yard with a fucking stick and you dig a fucking hole. You know, yeah. and you look at the hole and you look at the stick and you have a little fun. But kids don't have sticks anymore. I don't think there are any sticks left. I think they've all been recalled because of lead paint. <laughs> Who would have thought that one day the manufacturing of sticks would be outsourced to China? <laughs> but you know something, a kid shouldn't be wasting his time with a stick anyway. If he's four years old, he should be home studying for his kindergarten entrance exams. <laughs> Do you know about that shit? Oh, they have them now, yeah, yeah. There are places that have kindergarten entrance exams. The poor little fuck. The poor little fuck, he can barely locate his dick. You know, and, and al already he's being pressured to succeed. Pressured to succeed for the sake of the parents. Isn't this really just a sophisticated form of child abuse? And speaking of that, speaking of child abuse. Speaking of child abuse, next stop, grade school. Grade school, where he won't be allowed to play tag because it encourages victimization. And he won't be allowed to play dodgeball because it's exclusionary. And it promotes aggression. Standing around is still okay. Standing around is still permitted, but it won't be for long because sooner or later some kid is gonna be standing around and his foot will fall asleep and his parents will sue the school and it'll be goodbye fucking standing around. Now, you know, now. now, fortunately, all is not lost. All is not lost because at least we know that when he does get to play whatever games he is allowed to play, the child will never lose. 
We know he'll never lose because in today's America, no child ever loses. There are no losers anymore. Everyone's a winner. No matter what the game or sport or competition, everybody wins. Everybody wins, everybody gets a trophy. No one is a loser. No child these days ever gets to hear those all important character building words. You lost, Bobby. You lost, you're a loser, Bobby. They miss out on that. You know what they tell a kid who lost these days? You were the last winner. A lot of these kids never get to hear the truth about themselves until they're in their 20s. When their boss calls them in and says, Bobby, clean the shit out of your desk and get the fuck out of here, you're a loser. Get the fuck out of here. Of course, Bobby's parents can't understand why he can't hold a job. In school, he was always on the honor roll. Well, what they don't understand, of course, is that in today's schools, everyone is on the honor roll. Everyone is on the honor roll because in order to be on the honor roll, all you really need to do is to maintain a body temperature somewhere roughly in the 90s. But we shouldn't be worrying about how he's doing in school. Let's not worry about that because come summertime, he'll be off to camp. Yes, he'll be off to camp, but not to swim and hike and play softball. No, 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 no. Today's child will be sent away to lose weight. He'll be sent to fat camp or computer camp or violin camp or ceramics camp or leadership camp, whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> leadership camp, isn't that where Hitler went? Specialized, structured summer camps. Gotta keep the little fucker busy, you know? <laughs> Gotta keep the little fucker busy. Wouldn't want him to sneak in a little unstructured time in the woods. That wouldn't be any good. God knows he might start jacking off. <laughs> Especially these young boys, these adolescent males, and a lot of them, you know, <laughs> a lot of them, they kill themselves when they're jerking off. They don't mean to, it just happens. You know about that? Yeah, some of you know, I can tell. Yeah. A lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people never heard of that, you know? It's just one of those things Americans can't handle. We can't handle that, we don't talk about that. It's not on Larry King Live, it ain't on Barbara Walters. You ain't gonna see it in People Magazine, but it's out there, folks. It's out there and it's extremely common. You just ask any teenage boy you know who trusts you, ask him what he knows or what he's heard about cutting off your air supply just at the moment you're about to have a sexual release. He'll tell you an interesting story, story or two. The kids call it scarfing, because some of them use scarves to do it. Or screw the kid, just get on the internet, do it yourself. Google in the words autoerotic asphyxia. Autoerotic asphyxia, it's the practice of cutting off the oxygen to the brain at the last moment during masturbation in order to heighten the orgasm. And, and when I say common, a thousand kids a year die this way, okay? A thousand of them die, so think how many of them are trying to pull this off, if you pardon the little pun that I throw in there, just to, just to lighten the mood. But here's the way it works. Apparently, I never tried it, it sounded risky to me. Well, jerking off is all I need, you know what I mean, folks? I ain't trying to double my money, fuck that shit. Yeah, I just jerk off, wipe off my chest, get up and go to work, you know? That's it. Nothing fancy, and <laughs> nothing fancy at our house. We're simple folk. <laughs> but here's the way it's supposed to work, and this is why it's such a big attraction in the first place. Apparently, it is true, medically, physiologically speaking, that if you can cut off your air supply, the oxygen to your brain, just at the moment you're about to have an orgasm, the orgasm is about, I don't know, let's say 500 times better, something like that. It's incredibly intense. So, what you gotta do is stand up on a chair, or a bucket, or some kind of thing. You put a rope around your neck, and you start jerking off. <laughs> and while you're pulling your pud, while you're pulling your pud, you have to arrange to almost strangle yourself just before you have an orgasm. And by the way, while all this activity is going on, you gotta maintain a hard-on. Which ain't easy, because you might just be getting ready to buy the farm, 
So you better be fantasizing about someone you really like or something you really like. I don't know what it might be. Maybe getting fucked in the ass by a game warden. Who knows, huh? Hey, hey, I'm not here to judge. We're all different to each his own. So let's recap. Stand on a chair, rope around your neck, Peter in your hand. Now you have to time it just right so that just before you come, you almost die. And sometimes you miscalculate. You don't know if you're coming or going. You don't know. There's no way to know. No way to know. And the parents of these kids are too embarrassed to tell the police, so they put the kid's dick away and say he had poor grades. His girlfriend left him. Oh, well, no wonder, lady. Look at his fucking hobbies. <laughs> then they blame it on heavy metal, you know. I don't know if you remember that, but from that old incident there, some years back, a Judas Priest, one of the headbanging bands, somebody played a song and after that, and they killed themselves, and so they blame suicide on uh, heavy metal. If it's murder, they tend to blame rap these days, but it's never the parents. Do you ever notice this? Parents apparently play no part in the development and outcomes of these kids. Parents, you know, they can raise a kid apparently 11, 12, 13, 14, 50 years. If he turns out fucked up, boy, they had nothing to do with that. <laughs> Must be those kids at the parking lot he hangs around with. Parents got to be among the most full of shit people in the world. <laughs> well, they always have been, top to bottom, front to back. Listen, it in fairness, it comes with the job. If you want to be a parent, you got to be full of shit at least half the time. <laughs> Look at it this way. They have it both ways. If the kid turns out to be a loser, they had nothing to do with that. But boy, if he's a winner, got a scholarship or something like that, man, they're the first ones out there raising their hands trying to take a little credit. It's a nice state of mind if you can talk yourself into believing it. Here's another pack of low-grade morons who ought to be locked into portable toilets and set on fire. <laughs> These people with bumper stickers that say, we are the proud parents of an honor student <laughs> at the Franklin School. You know? or the Midvale Academy, or whatever other innocent-sounding name has been assigned to the indoctrination center where their child has been sent to be stripped of his individuality and turned into an obedient, soul-dead, conformist member of the American consumer culture. <laughs> Proud parents, what kind of empty people need to validate themselves through the achievements of their children? How would you like that to live with a couple of these misfits? How's that science project coming along, Justin? Fuck you, Dad. <laughs> you simple-minded prick. Mind your own business and pass the Cheerios. Here's a bumper sticker I'd like to see. We are the proud parents of a child whose self-esteem is sufficient that he doesn't need us promoting his minor scholastic achievements on the back of our car. That was pretty really sick, wasn't it? Or... Or, we are the proud parents of a child who has resisted his teacher's attempts to break his spirit and bend him to the will of his corporate masters. Just be a nice little for change, you know? Here's something realistic. We have a daughter in public school who hasn't been knocked up yet. Right? We have a son in public school who hasn't shot any of his classmates yet. But he does sell drugs to your honor student. Plus, he knocked up your daughter. <laughs> then there are the people who aren't too proud of their children. We are the embarrassed parents of a cross-eyed little nitwit who at the age of 10 not only continues to wet the bed, but also shits on the school bus. <laughs> Something like that on the back of the car might give the child a little more incentive, you know? Get him to try a little harder next semester. <laughs> now, all of this stupid bullshit that children have been so crippled by has grown out of something called the self-esteem movement. The self-esteem movement began in 1970, and I'm happy to say it has been a complete failure. <laughs> because studies have repeatedly shown that having high self-esteem does not improve grades, does not improve career achievement, it does not even lower the use of alcohol, and most certainly does not reduce the incidence of violence of any sort. Because as it turns out, extremely aggressive, violent people think very highly of themselves. 
Imagine that, sociopaths have high self-esteem. <laughs> Who would have thunk, huh? I love when this kind of thing happens. I love when these politically correct ideas crash and burn and wind up in the shithouse. Here's another one that bit the dust. This practice of playing Mozart during pregnancy so the fetus can hear it. It was supposed to increase intelligence. Didn't work, didn't work. All it did was sell a lot of CDs and piss off a whole lot of fetuses. <laughs> Here's another platitude they jam down your throat. Children are our future. Children are not our future. And I can prove it with my usual flawless logic. Children can't be our future because by the time the future arrives, they won't be children anymore, so blow me! <laughs> yes. As you may have noticed, I always like to present a carefully reasoned argument. <laughs> the self-esteem movement revolved around a single notion, the idea, the single idea, that every child is special. Boy, they said it over and over and over, as if to convince themselves, every child is special. And I kept saying, fuck you. <laughs> every child is clearly not special. <laughs> Did you ever look at one of them? Did you ever take a good close look at one of these fucking kids? <laughs> They're goofy. <laughs> They're fucking goofy looking. They're too small, they're way too fucking small. They're malapportioned, their heads don't fit their bodies, their arms are too weird and everything, they can't walk across the room in a straight line. And when they talk, they talk like I got a mouth full of shit. They're incomplete, incomplete, unfinished work. I never give credit for incomplete work. Now, P.T. Barnum might think they're special, but not me, I have standards. But let's say it's true. Let's grant this. I'm in a generous mood. Let's grant this proposition. Let's say it's true as somehow every child is special. What about every adult? Isn't every adult special too? And if not, then at what age do you go from being special to being not so special? And if every adult is special, then that means we're all special and the whole idea loses all its fucking meaning. And a similar mystery to me, motivation books, motivation seminars. Why would anyone need to be motivated by someone else? I say if you lack motivation, a seminar isn't gonna help you. What you really need is to be smashed in the head 30 or 40 times with a golf club. <laughs> That'll fucking motivate you. Or else it'll at least get you up and moving around the room. You know, locate your socks, shit like that. Get the day rolling. Motivation is bullshit. If you ask me, this country could use a little less motivation. The people who are motivated are the ones who are causing all the trouble. Stock swindlers, serial killers, child molesters, Christian conservatives. These people are highly motivated. Highly motivated. Yeah. And anyway, I think motivation is overrated. You show me some lazy prick who's lying around all day watching game shows and stroking his penis, and I'll show you someone's not causing any fucking trouble, okay? <laughs> all right, yeah. Hey. All right. Here's another horrifying aspect of American culture, the pussification, the continued pussification of the American male in the form... <laughs> Yeah, all right. In the form of Harley Davidson theme restaurants. What the fuck is going on here? Harley Davidson used to mean something. It stood for biker attitude. Grimy outlaws and their sweaty mamas full of beer and crank rolling around on Harleys looking for a good time, destroying property, raping teenagers, and killing policemen. <laughs> All very necessary activities, by the way. 
But now, fame restaurants, and this soft shit obviously didn't come from hardcore bikers. It came from these weekend motorcyclists, these fraudulent two-day-a-week motherfuckers who have their bikes trucked into Sturgis, South Dakota for the big rally and then ride around like they just came in off the road. Dentists and bureaucrats and pussy boy software designers. <laughs> Getting up on a Harley because they think it makes them cool. Well, hey, Skeezix, you ain't cool, you're fucking chilly. <laughs> and chilly ain't never been cool. And here, as long as we're talking about theme restaurants, I got a proposition for you. I think if white people are going to burn down black churches, then black people ought to burn down the House of Blues. Huh? <laughs> what a fucking disgrace that place is. The House of Blues. They ought to call it the House of Lame White Motherfuckers. <laughs> Inauthentic, low frequency, single digit lame white motherfuckers. Especially these male movie stars who think they're blues artists. You ever see these guys? Don't you just want to puke in your soup with one of these fat, balding, overweight, overaged, out of shape, middle aged male movie stars with sunglasses jumps on stage and starts blowing into a harmonica? It's a fucking sacrilege. In the first place, white people got no business playing the blues ever, at all, under any circumstances, ever, ever, ever. What the fuck do white people have to be blue about? Banana Republic ran out of khakis? Huh? The espresso machine is jammed? Hootie and the Blowfish are breaking up? Shit, white people ought to understand their job is to give people the blues, not to get them. <laughs> and certainly not to sing or play them. Tell you a little secret about the blues. It's not enough to know which notes to play. You got to know why they need to be played. And another thing, I don't think white people should be trying to dance like blacks. Stop that! <laughs> Stick to your faggoty polkas and waltzes. <laughs> and that repulsive country line dancing shit that you do. And be yourself, be proud, be white, be lame, and get the fuck off the dance floor. Now, I thank you. Now, listen, long as we're discussing minorities, I want to mention something about language in this country. There are a couple of terms that are used in connection with minorities, usually by guilty white liberals. First one is, happens to be. He happens to be black. I have a friend who happens to be black. Like it's a fucking accident, you know? <laughs> happens to be black. Yes, he happens to be black. Ah, yes, 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 yes. He had two black parents. Oh, yes, that's right, two black parents, yes. And they fucked? Oh, indeed they did. Yes. So where does the surprise part come in? I should think it would be more unusual if he just happened to be Scandinavian. And the other term is openly, openly gay. They'll say, he's openly gay. But this is the only minority they use that for. You know, you wouldn't say someone was openly black. Well, maybe James Brown. Or Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is openly black. Colin Powell is not openly black. Colin Powell is openly white. He just happens to be black. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And while we're at it, when did the word urban become synonymous with the word black? Did I fall asleep for eight or nine years? <laughs> urban trends, urban styles, urban music. I was not consulted on this at all. Didn't get a fax, didn't get an email. Didn't get a fucking postcard. Fine, that's all right. And I don't think white women should be calling each other girlfriend, okay? <laughs> Stop pretending to be black. And no matter what color you are, you go girl should probably go. <laughs> right along. Right along with you the man. Hey, you the man. Oh yeah, well you the fucking honky. <laughs> Here's another bunch of pus-headed telephone cretins. These self-important techno dicks 
who walk around with these hands-free telephone headsets and earpieces. Mr. Self-Important doesn't want to be too far from the phone in case Henry Kissinger calls. He's got the Dalai Lama on line two. I say, hey, spaceman. As long as your hands are free, reach over here and fondle my balls, would you please? <laughs> There are some more people who ought to be strapped into chairs and beaten with hammers. <laughs> people who wear visors. Let me ask you something. What the fuck is the point in wearing half a hat? Either get a hat or don't. No one's interested in the top of your head. Go back to the store and tell them to give you the rest of the hat. They cheated you. Better still, get yourself one of them little Jewish hats and sew it to your visor. <laughs> then you got yourself a full-fledged fucking hat, my friend. Here are some more musical vermin whose mothers we wish had had medical plans that included abortion. <laughs> these singers, these singers who think they're so special, they only need one name. Bono, Sting, Jewel, Tiffany, Prince. What a crock of shit. Get a fucking last name, would you please? I got a nice two-word name for you. Pretentious cocksucker. How do you like that? Bono, Sting. It's not bad enough the music sucks, but with no last name, you can't find out where they live to throw a fucking bomb through their window. It's frustrating. Here is another pack of jack-offs who ought to be strangled in front of their children. People who pay for inexpensive items with a credit card. <laughs> you know, folks, take my word for this. Raisinets is not a major purchase. <laughs> Get some fucking cash together. No one should be paying a bank 18% interest on Tic Tacs. And you're holding up the fucking line, too. Some dorky looking prick with a fanny pack waiting to be approved for a bag of cheese doodles. <laughs> I need this like I need an infected scrotum. Get some fucking money. Next guy ahead of me online pays for Newsweek with a credit card is getting stabbed in the eyes. <laughs> and just to wind up this little group of complaints, finally, this is a, a group of social criminals. These people in the space program. Nassholes, I call them. <laughs> in case you haven't heard, the latest disaster for the rest of the universe is that the United States is gonna go to Mars, okay? Oh yeah, we're gonna go to Mars. And then of course, we're going to colonize deep space with our microwave hot dogs and plastic vomit, fake dog shit and cinnamon dental floss and lemon scented toilet paper and sneakers with lights in the heels. <laughs> and all these other impressive things we've done down here. But let me ask you this, let me ask you this. What are we going to tell the Intergalactic Council of Ministers the first time one of our teenage mothers throws her newborn baby into a dumpster, huh? How are we going to explain that to the space people? How are we going to let them know that our ambassador was only late for the meeting because his breakfast was cold and he had to spend half an hour punching his wife around the kitchen? Now, what are they going to think when they find out it's just a local custom that over 80 million women in the third world have had their clitorises forcibly removed in order to reduce their sexual pleasure so they won't cheat on their husbands? Can't you just sense how eager the rest of the universe is for us to show up? <laughs> Can't you see them out there? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Suicide is an interesting topic to me because it's an inherently interesting decision to decide voluntarily not to exist anymore. It's profound. You know what it is? It's the ultimate makeover. That's why I think it belongs on television. In this, in this depraved culture we live in, with all these reality shows, suicide and television will be a natural. I'll bet you could have an all-suicide channel on cable TV. I'll bet you, shit, they got all golf. What the fuck, huh? <laughs> God damn. Jeez. You ever watch golf? You ever watch golf? It's like watching flies, fuck. 
If you can get a bunch of brainless assholes to sit down and waste a Sunday afternoon on that kind of shit, you know you can get some people to watch some suicides. All day long, 24 hours a day, nothing but suicides. Must die TV. You get a lot of people watching that shit. You get a lot of people volunteering to be on there too. Just so their friends can see them on TV. People are fucking goofy. You get a lot of volunteers. You get all them leftover assholes from Let's Make a Deal. They'd be lined up around the block, pushing each other out of the way, pushing on funny capes and caps and hamp hats and makeup and calling themselves Captain Suicide. Guys would be competing for most unusual method. People would be jumping off of silos, lighting themselves on fire, putting rat poison on the taco, drinking, mopping glow, sticking mothballs up their ass. You'd probably have some weird fuck show up and figure out how to kill himself with dental floss and a stinger missile. People are fucking goofy. I bet you could find you a married couple. In this country, shit. I bet you, you could find a married couple in one of them trailer parks or something who'd be perfectly willing to sit in a love seat and blow each other's heads off with shotguns while a love song is playing. People are fucking nuts. This country is full of nitwits and assholes. You ever notice that? Oh my goodness, yes. Oh my goodness, right. Yeah. Nitwits, assholes, fuck-ups, scumbags, jerk-offs, and dipshits. And they all vote. They all vote, yeah. In fact, sometimes you get the impression they're the only ones who vote. You can usually tell who's been doing the voting by looking at the fucking election returns. Man, it sure ain't me out there wasting my time with a meaningless activity like that. You know those people on the Jerry Springer show? Those are the average Americans. Oh yeah, believe me, below average can't get on the show. Can't get on. Below average are sitting home watching that shit on TV. Getting ready to go out and vote. Filling out their sample ballot. People are fucking dumb. You can say what you want about this country, and I love this place. I love the freedoms we used to have. I love it. I love that. You know? Uh-huh. I love it when it didn't take a fucking catastrophe to get us to care for one another. I love the fact that we're on camera all the time from all angles. But you know what, you can say what you want about America. And I say I love this place. I wouldn't have it any other way. Wouldn't live in any other time in history in any other place. I'm an interesting guy. I always hope that no matter how small the original problem is, it's going to grow into bigger and bigger proportions that get completely out of control. And I'll give you a concrete example. Let's say a water main breaks in downtown Los Angeles and it floods an electrical substation, knocking out all the traffic lights and tying up the entire city and emergency vehicles can't get through. And at the same time, one of those month-long global warming heat waves comes along, but there's no air conditioning, there's no water for sanitation, so cholera, smallpox, and dysentery break out and thousands of people start dying in the streets. But before they die, parasites eat their brains and they go completely fucking crazy and they storm the hospital, but the hospital can't handle all the casualties, so these people rape all the nurses and set the hospital on fire. And the flames drive them even crazier, so they start stabbing social workers and garbage men. And a big wind comes along and the entire city goes up in flames. And the people who are still healthy, they get mad at the sick people and they start crucifying them, nailing them to crosses, trying on their underwear, shit like that. <laughs> then everybody smokes crack and PCP and they march on City Hall where they burn the mayor at the stake, strangle his wife and take turns sodomizing the statue of Larry Flint. And at this point, at this point, it looks like pretty soon things are going to start to get out of control. <laughs> so everybody panics and tries to leave the city at the same time. And, and they trample each other to death in the streets by the thousands and wild dogs eat their corpses. And the wild dogs chase the rest of the people down the highway. And one by one, the dogs pick off the old fucks and the slow people because they're in the fast lane where they don't belong. Get the fuck out of the fast lane if you're an old fuck, if you're a slow fuck. Get over on the right. Get over on the right. And then... And the lucky ones, the lucky people who managed to make it all the way outside of town, they discover when they get there that big sparks from the city have lit the suburbs on fire. And the suburbs burn uncontrollably. And thousands of identical homes have identical fires with identical smoke. Killing all the identical soccer moms and their identical kids named Jason and Jennifer. And now, now the fire spreads to the farmlands and the farmlands burn intensely at 425 degrees, creating millions of baked potatoes. And... As the farmlands burn, as the farmlands burn, thousands of barns and farmhouses begin to explode from all the hidden methamphetamine labs. And the meth chemicals run downhill into the rivers and streams where wild animals drink the water and get completely geeked on speed. So bears and wolves amped up on cranks start roaming the countryside looking for people to eat, even though they're not really hungry. 
And the fire spreads to the forest, and the forest burn furiously, and hundreds of elves and trolls and fairies come running out of the woods screaming, Bambi is dead! Bambi is dead! And he is, he is. Finally, that fucking little cunt Bambi is dead. Dead. And now... Now hundreds of regional fires come together into one huge interstate inferno and all 12 of the western United States are burning out of control except Utah where the Mormons don't allow fires. <laughs> and, and the fire spreads across the Great Plains toasting the wheat, cooking the cattle and producing hamburgers actually. <laughs> then it leaps the Mississippi and races through the south blowing up stills, interrupting lynchings and killing millions of inbred people. And then... It turns northeast and it heads for Washington, D.C., where George Bush can't decide if it's an emergency or not. He can't decide this. He doesn't know. It's hard. Oh, it's hard work. You know? No. Oh. Yeah. He, he can't decide because Dick Cheney is in prison. So, instead, he takes a nap. He takes a nap. He puts his empty fucking brainless head down on the little pillow his mother gave him at Christmas time, and he takes a fucking nap. So the fire moves to Philadelphia, but it's a weekend, and Philadelphia's closed on the weekend. So the fire moves to New York City, and the people in New York tell the fire to go fuck itself. Go fuck yourself. Yeah, and it does. Yeah. And it does. So instead, it burns down Long Island and Connecticut, killing all the rich white assholes and completely destroying their evil faggoty golf courses. <laughs> And while all this is going on, Canada burns to the ground, but nobody notices. <laughs> and now the entire North American continent is on fire, producing a huge thermal updraft and creating an incendiary cyclonic macro system that forms a hemispheric megastorm, breaking down the molecular structure of the atmosphere and actually changing the laws of nature. Fire and water combine, burning clouds of flaming rain fall upward. Gamma rays and solar winds ignite the ionosphere, creating huge clouds of ionized plasma. Bolts of lightning 20 million miles long begin shooting out of the North Pole and the sky fills up with green shit and then suddenly the entire fabric of space-time splits in two a huge crack in the universe opens and all the dead people from the past begin falling through Babe Ruth, Groucho Marx, Davy Crockett, Tiny Tim, Porky Pig, Hitler, Janis Joplin, Alan Ludden, my Uncle Dave, your Uncle Dave everybody's Uncle Dave, an endless stream of dead Uncle Dave's falling through the crack and all the dead Uncle Daves gather around a heavenly kitchen table. They light up cigarettes and they begin to talk. They talk about how they never got a break, how their parents didn't love them and their children were ungrateful. They talk about how the government screwed them out of money and they just missed out on a big job. They say the Jews own everything and the blacks get special treatment. And all the hatred and bitterness drips out of these people and forms a big pool of liquid hate. And the pool of liquid hate begins to spin. Round and round it spins, faster and faster. And the faster it spins, the bigger it gets. Faster and faster, bigger and bigger, until the whirling pool of hate is bigger than the entire universe. And then suddenly it explodes into trillions of tiny stars. And every star has a trillion planets. And every planet has a trillion Uncle Daves. And all the Uncle Daves have good jobs, perfect eyesight, and shoes that fit. They have great sex lives and free health care. They understand the internet. Their kids think they're cool, and they all love their neighbors. And every week, without fail, Uncle Dave wins the lottery. Forever and ever, till the end of time, every single Uncle Dave has a winning ticket. And Uncle Dave is finally happy. Now do you see why I like it when nature gets even with humans? Thanks for coming in here tonight.